to happen, guys. Now we're going to go ahead and uh, send this off to our interview with Fiesel and Sen. Hi. Well, I hope you enjoyed that refreshing speed run. And coming up next, we've got Ocarina of Time Glitchless, but here to tell us about some of the prizes that you can win if you donate during Ocarina of Time is our prize guy, Sent. Hey, Fiesel, it's, uh, it's great to be here. That was, um, that was an interesting run. Are, are you thirsty now? Uh, yeah, something about that run made me thirsty. S same here, I'm really, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure what I want to drink either to quench <laughs> uh, that thirst. Yeah, no, I'm, maybe water. <laughs> yeah, probably water is the best thing. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, yeah, we, we have a couple of really cool prizes here for Ocarina of Time uh, Glitchless. Uh, first off, from our friend Maze Guy, we have a copy of Ocarina of Time as well as the official Nintendo Power Strategy Guide for the That's game. Right. In case you get lost in the game, yeah. there I you mean, go. Yeah, just in case you can't, you know, use all these crazy speedrun strats you're going to see. Don't, don't worry, these guys got your back. Um, you know, maybe if you prefer to play the game on a bit of a newer console, we do also have a copy of uh, Ocarina of Time 3D for 3DS. Very know. nice. Great, great 3D remake of the game. Uh, from our good friend of the stream and runner, uh, Cosmic the Dolphin, who unfortunately couldn't be here this year, we have a CD of uh, the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time soundtrack, as well as a book of sheet music from the entire Legend of Zelda series. So. Oh, wow, that's really nice. Yeah, you can listen to some of your favorite songs and then maybe even learn how to play them on uh, piano or any stringed instrument. And finally, from uh, our friends over at the Legends of Localization team and uh, from Fangamer, we have Legends of Localization Book 1, uh, The Legend of Zelda. Uh, Legends of Localization is its a book. It, it's great. I got to read it on the plane over, actually. Uh, it talks about pretty much everything in the original Zelda game and how it was translated. And it really goes into depth, um, you know, culturally, uh, uh, technically, like all the Famicom had a bit of a better sound chip. You know, how sure. did that affect the intro? How, how do American fans and Japanese fans kind of react to these songs in different ways? Um, you know, it talks about just about every single text box in the game and, and how it was translated and the struggle of, of translating. Um, you know, as someone who, who does enjoy uh, some longer games that may or may not have been translated by their parent companies, you know, often I think, well, why can't they just put it into English? You know, as it turns out, there's, there's a lot that goes yeah, into, that goes into making a game where even a game with as little text as The Legend mm -hmm. of Zelda. So, super right. interesting. Yeah, so happy to have A lot these. of information in that book. I was looking through that. It's pretty, it's pretty dense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so happy to have these. Uh, and... After Legend of Zelda, we are going to be seeing a Pikmin speedrun. You know, Pikmin, probably not the first game you think of uh, when you think speedrunning, but definitely, the speed definitely runs pretty solid. Yeah, definitely an interesting run for right. sure. And uh, absolutely, we have. I'm holding this upside down. <laughs> I don't know how to shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we we have this lovely Pikmin T-shirt, uh, also from Fan Gamer. Uh, choice of size available there. So if you're not a large man like me, don't worry, they've got you covered. <laughs> Right, well, it's a really nice looking shirt, and all these prizes, uh, you can get information about them, what the minimum donation amount is for them. Uh, do you happen to know what the ones up here, or do they all have the same? Um, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of them donation. right now. I'm, I'm not sure, but if you head over to gamesdonequick.com, you can check out the tracker, and it'll, it'll have all that information for you, as well as uh, upcoming runs, donation incentives, and uh, bonus games you can put your donations towards. Mm -hmm. All right, so go check that out, gamesdonequick.com and donate at any point during Ocarina of Time Glitchless, and you could win one of those prizes. And with that, uh, we're going to send you over, so enjoy Ocarina of Time. Welcome back, guys. Um, I'm going to read just a couple few donations before I hand myself off over to Calirica. Um, we got a $50 donation from Nobody64 saying, Boyks, you are absolutely killing it. Got a $64 donation from Dark Hall. Says, gotta get a great glitch show for Zelda. So it's a ten dollar uh, from uh, Weezels. If I had only known this earlier in my life, that Pepsi is the solution to every problem ever. We also got a twenty five dollar donation from Big Man. Almost after almost eighteen years, I finally finished Ocarina of Time to Summer. Here's twenty five dollars to the Ocarina Glitch Exhibition. In the words of our young hero, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
once again, guys, if you want that exhibition to happen, we are very close. We're at $37,877. We need $40,000. We are there, guys. Make it happen. We have a $250 donation from Ted G. Shout out to my friends on GamingExodus.com. Thanks to the runners and the crew of SG SGDQ. You're doing awesome things. Donation is going towards Aquaria Time Glitch Exhibition. Yeah! 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 Wow, they really like that, apparently. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, send in the torch to Calerica. Thank you guys for having me. I will see you guys later. Thanks a bunch for that. I don't know how on earth we're going to follow all of those runs, but it's time for a child favorite. I know I grew up with Ocarina of Time as well as many of you. Um, we got a bunch of donations coming in for it. For example, we have a $100 donation here from Rizu Chan. OOT is what got me into speed running. Got to watch it every year. Here's $100 to see the best part, the glitches. Although we're doing our glitchless run First, and that'll be a lot of fun too, not just the glitches. We have a $1,000 donation from Navi of the Deku Forest. Hey, listen! I convinced Link to donate all his rupees in his giant's wallet to help fight this cancer of yours. As you all well know, the great Deku tree died of a similar kind of disease. It's horrible, and we would not wish it even on Ganondorf. We hope the rupee to dollar conversion rate is in your favor. We get to go. Quick before you go, we just hit seven hundred thousand dollars nice. donated. Nice. We wanted to announce that quick. <laughs> All right, so this is OOT. We're gonna get going because we have quite a long run ahead of us. Let's do this. <laughs> Should I start time? <laughs> Reset? <laughs> Were no? we not ready? Yes. Yeah. Let's Let's reset. <laughs> Take two. Take two. All right, should I get a count in? All right. Three, two, one, go. All right, introductions. I'm Danny B. I am Jethro TV. I'm Torje. I'm Datsu. And, and that's Monkly. That's Monkly. Without a mic, he might have one later. <laughs> All right, so this is Glitchless Any Percent. Uh, it's going to be the same as Glitchless MST, Glitchless All Dungeons. Uh, all those are exactly the same because uh, there's no glitches that we can do to skip any of the dungeons or any of the main parts of the game. Um, so this category is... One of the oldest ones. It's gone through a lot of changes recently. Um, should take around three hours and 40 minutes under that if it's a good run. Uh, and there's, in the beginning, there's going to be a few cutscenes. Uh, it's kind of like Majora's Mask in that sense. If uh, we can get through the first half hour, it's going to get really fast paced. The beginning is a bit like a feature film, <laughs> but it's a pretty good one. Until you've seen it like 1,000 times. <laughs> Gives us an opportunity to announce that the glitch excavation hat. Exhibition, excuse me, has been met. Nice. Nice. That's absolutely perfect. So we're going to see Glitchless and what Glitchless can do, and then everybody will get to see just how broken this game is when you introduce the glitches. Just quite broken. <laughs> Very broken. All right, well, so first thing first about going fast, I suppose. Uh, Danny B is spamming pretty hard right here to save the frames on the introduction. <laughs> Um, there are little blue boxes that pop up on the uh, text boxes. Um, 
if you spam fast enough, you won't see those, and you save, what is it, one frame? One frame per, yeah. Yeah, so this game runs at 20 frames per second. Uh, and the way text boxes work is that one character shows up every frame, and it scrolls across the screen. Um, and so we play in Japanese because in Japanese there are a lot fewer characters in every text box uh, and fewer text boxes overall. And so over the course of a long run like this where we have a lot of text, Japanese actually saves as much as 20 minutes. No one's timed it totally to the second, but it's around there. And there is a Chinese version of this game, but it's console specific to something called the IQ. And it's actually, it should be faster since Chinese is even more condensed than Japanese, but the controller is terrible and no one wants to play on it for four hours. Hey, we should note that we're on Wii Virtual Console as well right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, we're not on a Nintendo 64. But uh, Danny B is playing with a Nintendo 64 controller. Just in case anybody's curious. Because childhood. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I played this game a lot when I was a kid, and I had a lot of leftover muscle memory on an N64 controller. Most people play on GameCube controllers, since you can plug them right into the Wii, and they're generally considered to be an all-around better controller for speedrunning this game. But uh, I decided to be the weird one. Some people might be angry at that statement. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Saria's fairy is a random color, and it's red, I think. I that call it red. Like red. Yeah. red. Red splits. fairy, red splits. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the first thing we're going to do is go get the Kokiri sword, and on the, along the way, we're going to collect some rupees to buy a Deku shield, because we need to go to the Deku tree to get out of the forest, but Mido is in the way. And now, something you might notice if you haven't watched OT speedruns at all is that we're not walking or rolling forward. We're doing a lot of back walking and a lot of side hopping. Um, and that's basically because it's faster, to put it simply. Uh, the fastest normal sort of way of movement is back walking. So you'll see that as long as the distance we're back walking is great enough that it's worth it. Uh, generally, we say that anything over four rolls or so, four or five, is going to be worth back walking. Also worth noting that with Child Link, if you could side hop frame perfectly, that would be faster. But it's pretty impractical to use that in too many places. Especially on slopes. But you see it a lot in Tasses. So, crawl space is fun. All right, so first trick of the run coming up. We call it bridge clip, but it's not a clip. The bottom of this bridge doesn't exist. Nice. That's frame perfect. And basically what happens is he just jumps, and then at the right frame, he jump slashes, which gives him a little bit more height, and the bridge just goes, now you're on the bridge. All right, sword and shield acquired. So as I'm sure chat's going crazy because I just did what is called a clip but isn't really, um, the rules for this category are definitely a little funky. Uh, this game has a huge spectrum of things that we can do, and it's impossible to actually define what is a glitch and what isn't. So basically what we've done is a group of runners who run this category have gotten together and made a set of rules. We've drawn a line in the sand and said everything on this side is a glitch and everything on that side isn't. Uh, and if you guys are curious to know exactly what is and what isn't, um, you can go to the nice. FAQ. It's <laughs> a little boost there. Yeah. I've got an FAQ uh, on my channel, and I've got a link to a paste bin where you can see the rules and find out exactly what is and what isn't uh, banned in this category, since listing it all would be uh, impossible, because I can't. Yeah, generally the guideline is if you don't introduce new tech into the game, then it's allowed. So if we can skip something without actually doing a glitch, then we can skip it. And as we go through the run, we'll see some examples of where the limits of that are pushed, For sure. and we'll point them out. Deku Tree. Here we go. All right. We have now acquired the most powerful item in the game. I'm not kidding. <laughs> He's going to skip a Navi text box right there by pulling a weapon and as he grabs the vines. It keeps Link busy. More on that later. Yeah, more on that later. Skips the Navi text again there. Yep. These Skilchulas are 
RNG to the max. Uh. Wow. <laughs> So now I'm gonna get the text box because I'm too close to the vines. Jumping on the chest there was the reason, or that was the reason I jumped on the chest. It's faster. Oh, also, I can't on. hear that guy for my life. So I'm gonna stop talking. Okay. Wow. This is basically how Daker Tree goes. It's actually one of the most maddening temples in the game, at least in my opinion. Okay, there, there we, we go. go. You can manipulate them by moving correctly, but it's pretty difficult. That is not a correct angle. Oh. All right, so that was supposed to be B1 skip. And if you get a jump slash on the right couple of frames there, you will actually land up on top of this thing, which I'm going to get up to now, so you don't have to do most of the dungeon. But C up is annoying, so it might take a second to get the right aim. Which I did not. Thankfully, this backup strat is here, and so we don't need to do like the entirety of B1. There we go. There we go. Now, you might see in some other speedruns of this game that you can clip through that web right there and not bother burning it. Um, that would be considered a glitch, so we are going to burn it. Two, three, one. All right, so a little bit of a messy start. That's OK. Deku Tree is one of those places where I reset 90% of my runs. <laughs> Deku Tree is honestly terrible. It's a terrible place. Now, if you played this game casually, you may be thinking, how are we going to beat Goma without the slingshot? Because we didn't get the slingshot. Most powerful weapon in the game. <laughs> Deku nuts. And right there, he, jo he jump slashed with a stick, which uh, stores damage. Because crouch stabs in this game are a little bit broken in that they do the damage value of whatever attack preceded it, so long as, you're, as, long as you didn't go through a loading zone. And so a Deku Stick Jump Slash does, does a ton of damage. So what I did there, Goma is supposed to, after you do a certain amount of damage, uh, she's supposed to get up, climb on the ceiling, and drop those eggs that everyone hates. Um, but if you, after you do a certain amount of damage, and before she climbs on the ceiling, if you time a Deku Nut properly, uh, you can keep her down, stun lock her, and get in the proper amount of damage to kill her. And to go back to what Dotzo was saying a moment ago about storing damage, uh, it's worth just noting that like the Deku Stick does Master Sword damage, which is awesome, except they usually break when you hit something with them. So the fact that we can store that Master Sword damage and then use it through Crouch Stabs is really, really powerful because you know, we have a lot more damage available to us as Child Link. Yeah, yeah. Master Sword is twice as powerful as the Kukri Sword, so a Jump Slash with Master Sword does four damage which is a lot more than the one that a normal Kokiri Sword Slash does and two for a Jump Slash. And he picked up a heart there. Normally, uh, in runs of this game, you don't see people pick up hearts. Uh, but for this, since we're not going to be getting the Goron Tunic, because it's terrible, we need uh, 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 hearts, uh, maximum HP, for uh, Fire Temple and Fire Trial. And that's because the timers in the Temple and the Trial uh, the amount of time they give you is based on your health, so we need enough health for the timer to be high enough that we can get through it. And you'll see that when we get there later in the run. Yeah. All right, so this is the cutscene that means you failed the wrong warp, so if you guys <laughs> need to <laughs> give a couple donations, we have some time. Certainly, we are getting quite a few because of how awesome this game is, including a $1,000 anonymous donation. <laughs> Just because it's Zelda. <laughs> I think that's all that needs to be said there. I agree. Oh, where's the other? We had another $1,000. Thousand and $1,024 donation. We're, we're taking two to binary powers here. It's also anonymous donation. Said, let's get those glitches going after this run, of course, <laughs> right? <laughs> let's see. We have quite a few anonymous donations here. Another $100 anonymous donation. Legend of Zelda time. 
played every Legend of Zelda game and excited to see this run. We have a $50 donation from, I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher your screen name, Vences23? Says, I watched 10 hours of SGDQ only to say, go Danny, go, you can do it. <laughs> so this might be a good time to start talking about owl skips. Yeah. Um, so earlier in Decatree, when I climbed the first set of vines, uh, and Dalto said that I skipped the Navi text by pulling out a Deku stick. Um, so when you are pulling out weapons in this game, uh, after you press the, the button for a weapon, it takes like three frames, sometimes two, sometimes four, depending on the weapon, um, for Link to actually have it active in his hands. He like reaches back to grab it. Uh, and during that time, you can't interact with certain uh, NPC triggers, such as Navi or Owls. And so, if you uh, pull out another weapon right as the first weapon becomes active, you can chain them together. And if you frame perfectly chain them together while you're walking through the entirety of an owl trigger, you can not talk to the owl and end up on the other side. Uh, so that's coming up. There are three of them in this run. They're all in child section. Uh, so I'm going to try to get at least one of them to show that off. It's a hard trick. It involves like 20 frame perfect inputs in a row, one input every four frames. Um, so what I'm going to actually do to help myself is I've got my phone here, I've got an, a metronome app running, and the metronome is running at 300 beats per minute, which is the tempo needed for one beat every four frames. So I'm gonna put a little earpiece in my ear, listen to the metronome, and see if we can get it. So that's gonna come up right after we get the Fairy Ocarina from Saria. Uh, in my PB, I got two of the three. I've gotten all three maybe 10 times total. Even with the help of the metronome and getting the rhythm down, maintaining it through the entire owl trigger is really tough. I think I've done it like twice ever. <laughs> it's definitely not easy. Bye bye, Deku Tree. Good riddance. <laughs> <laughs> There's a girl. Hopefully I don't get stuck. Yep. Okay. You can get stuck on her. <laughs> it's happy. the exact wrong angle. Now Saria is going to give us the ocarina. All right, so just a little roadmap here. Once we get past um, Saria's song, which will happen in about 15 minutes. Uh, the cutscenes will seriously go away, and for the most part, it'll just be the cutscene after each dungeon. Also, sorry, is Fairy's blue now? <laughs> because it changes? Yeah, so we talked about that before, but all the Kokiri children, Saria included, um, their fairies just pull random RGB values when they load. Yeah, it's weird. So we Little. like to try to guess what it's gonna be. <laughs> a little bit of flavor for the game, I guess. All right, so got no more input until the owl skips. So I'm going to just take this off real quick, have it around my neck, and listen to the metronome. Serious time. Now, Danny B needs support for these owl skips, so all of chat should be spamming owl skip right now. It will help him, I promise. There's the owl we're going to try to skip. First one's the hardest. They are indeed spamming it. First yeah. one's the hardest. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yes! <laughs> that was beautiful. Rupees, by the way. Yeah. yeah, so he was swapping the sword and the Deku stick, and as you can see, it kept him sliding straight through. If he had missed one input during that entire time, the owl would have triggered and we would have had to talk to it. 
Yeah, that slide only happens because he started so early in the animation, it kind of just cancels it. But it's not important. So I'm going to get 80 rupees here. So, or 100, actually, 99. So I can buy the Hylian Shield. <laughs> Alright, made it before night, that's the important part. <laughs> there we go. Alright, Dana B's back in action. <laughs> All right, so in case the mic missed what he said, uh, we've got 99 rupees there so we can get the Hylian shield. And if you've watched any BD runs before, you might have seen him buy the Hylian shield at a different point in the run. Uh, this is a very small sort of marathon safe strat. Uh, it's going to give us an option in Dodongo's cavern to equip the Hylian shield in case we're in danger of burning our Kokiri shield. All right, so what I'm going to do here is a little movement setup to enter back into the market so I can spawn Melon here and get the egg. But I'm going to enter the market at zero speed because I want time to pass. And if I enter the market at zero speed, I can get back here as soon as possible. Time of day doesn't pass in the market, but it does pass here. And I need to be able to get to Talon first thing in the morning. And so the only roadblock here is how long it takes to get to morning. Yeah, so we're minimizing our time in the market by taking more time here. Now this owl that I just talked to, it is possible to skip it too. Um, but Malon is inside the text trigger of the owl, and so that makes it really hard to do so. Um, and on top of that, even if I could, which I can, but it's really hard, talk to Malon and get on these vines before the owl talks to me, the owl trigger actually extends on the top of the vines as well. So as soon as I were to leave the vines and get onto the top, I would have to start weapon swapping again on the very first frame of control up here. So it's really hard, it's not really run viable, so I'm not even going to try. A little shortcut here past this guard. That only works at night because they're blind at night. Well, they're blind anyway. But. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> but yeah, let's hope they are blind and they're not snipers today. We're going to go inside the castle in a little bit, and they, there are sets of guards, as I'm sure many of you remember. And the very first guard is a bit of a jerk. Sometimes you go right by, no problem, and sometimes he just has eagle eyes and catches you out of nowhere. Um, and Danny B and I actually tied for the worst luck ever <laughs> <laughs> when we got sniped by the first guard four times in a row. And there was nothing we could do about it. So you see, morning is coming now, and we made it before morning. And that's all that matters, because I just got to sit here and wait for the egg to hatch so I can wake this guy up. Come on, Mario. Wake up. All right, so this block puzzle, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do some of it. But uh, you don't need to push all the blocks to the end. We can extend our jumps. You saw a little bit earlier when I got past that first guard, the shortcut that Jeth Jethro mentioned. Um, jump slashes can extend your jump a little bit. So we're going to use that here again. Very small note, if we do get caught by guards, you'll note that the boxes move themselves into the solved position, which is kind of nice. All right, that's the jerk. We made it past him. I'm going to wait here for this guy, because he's the, like, he turns his head really fast. So the way these guards work is there's kind of two caught states. There's when they see you, and then there's like another frame. And if you can do frame perfect side hops, you'll never get caught. But again, that's really hard. Those are actually pretty good guards. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty solid. <laughs> All right, and now we get to talk to Zelda for kind of a long time. Yeah, so if those guards see you, uh, they will catch you right away if you are on the ground for more than one frame at a time. Um, but if you maintain frame-perfect side ops, you can and make it to the screen transition, uh, then they will not catch you. And one weird thing is if you are on the frame that they catch you and you screen transition at the same time, they can still catch you. 
and the, sc the screen will transition, and then they'll walk into the new transition to screen to catch you, and it's infuriating. <laughs> I think I think we might have some time for donations. Yeah, for sure. Because this cutscene is forever. It certainly is. But first, <laughs> I just want to make an announcement. As you know, we met the crazy high donation amount that we needed for this glitch ex exhibition. Why can I not say that word? <laughs> Coming up after this run. Um, but we do have quite a few more donation centers to go. And the biggest one for tomorrow is the Pokemon Blue Reverse Badge Order tomorrow after Pokemon Red Run. And that still needs a good $45,000. So we met this one, which was 40000 So we can certainly meet the next one. So get your donations in before that's um, got, what, 14 hours to go, so I have full confidence that we can make that happen. And now for some donations. Oh, goodness, we've got quite a few here. We have a $100 donation from Tyvra saying, since there's so much work to silence Navi, I'll fill the void. Hey, listen! Hey, hey, listen! <laughs> Put this towards reader's choice. Sad that he didn't say, hey, watch out! I'll do that one instead. Uh, we have a $20 donation from Tega. I love Ocarina of Time so much, so my donation had to be during the OOT run. Good luck to the runner, and I've had a blast being here this year. Thanks to everyone's hard work to make this week awesome. Oh, and this can go to runner's choice. A $50 anonymous donation. A flashback of my childhood in three hours and 45 minutes. Take my money. Keep up the amazing runs. $25 donation from Shiny Ass Akusa. Ah, Ocarina of Time, I am so happy that this game is being run again this year. I really love the longer categories, so much more meat to bite into. A $500 donation from Mr. West. <laughs> Been replaying Ocarina of Time all week in preparation for this run. So excited. Best of luck, kill the animals. I don't know, will we be killing any cuckoos during this run? Uh, no. We won't even, oh, actually, we'll interact with one cuckoo. <laughs> Perfect. Let's see. A 500, another $500 donation. This is from Kevin and Annalisa Wells. This is the first SGDQ I've been able to watch live, and I'm excited to finally be able to donate during the Oak of Time Run, which was the first game I ever saw as a speedrun. Keep up the good work and go kill Ganondorf. A $100 donation from Rivi Kim. I grew up playing Zelda. Link became a staple that I associated with good times and good friends. This run is nostalgic as well as entertaining for me. Much love to the entire gaming community. So something that's interesting about cutscenes with songs that we could mention is that depending on the cutscene, sometimes you learn the song right at the beginning of it, and sometimes you don't learn it until the middle of the cutscene. Um, like, if you watch glitched runs, you'll see us skip this cutscene by entering it um, and killing ourselves at the same time because we get the song as soon as we enter it. Um, but songs like Saria's song, you don't learn it until the very middle of the cutscene, so we can't skip that one as easily. Just a small note. Yeah, it's weird. I don't know why that happens. Of course, we're not skipping them in glitchless anyways, yeah. but I just think that's an interesting Sad. fact. Yeah. So cutscene skips are not particularly disallowed in glitchless. Um, but using death to skip a cutscene is. Uh, so we will skip a couple of really small cutscenes later in the run using some other methods. Okay, the run has started. The run has started. <laughs> <laughs> so if you noticed earlier, right before I woke up Talon, I ran into the, I swam in the moat a little bit, picked up a couple of rupees. Um, so I got 99 on the chains, because 99 is the max. Uh, spent 80, so I had 19, and then I got a couple in the moat. Uh, all I needed to do was get one in the moat, and then I had 20, and that's all the rupees I'll need for the whole run. I just need to spend 80, and then spend 20 on the diving game for Silver Scale later. Uh, and then you don't need to buy anything else in the whole game. So we're not gonna do the bottle here. These cuckoos are going to be left in peace. Hello. <laughs> Ow. 
So this guy actually gives you, when you talk to him, gives you a discount on the shield in the market because you're supposed to go back and get one since it's dangerous up here. But we already have one for one, but in the non-marathon safe route, uh, we would get the discount here. And the discount is, uh, it makes the shield cost anywhere between 45 and 75 rupees, I think, or is it 40 and 75? I think it's 45. Okay, and it's any multiple of five between those. It's interesting that they bothered to make that random, of all things. I mean, they made fairy colors random, so. <laughs> So where we're headed right now is we're going to go get Sarya's song, uh, but first we're going to go to uh, Goron City and use the shortcut back to Lost Woods. Yeah, Goron City and Death Mountain in general are kind of a hub in this game because they have connections to Kakariko as well as um, Lost Woods. So I'm going to keep my camera inverted here and roll into the camera because this is rolling Goron here and he won't hit me if I keep the camera away from him. Uh, and that's an interesting point in this game is that often if something's not on camera it will load a lot later than normal because the game tries to save on memory. So uh, in a lot of cases I'll be using camera manipulation to keep enemies or objects unloaded until I want them loaded. There's actually quite a lot of camera manipulation in this run, but it's it's always so subtle that... Yeah, we'll try, we should try to point it out as we go, but... And speaking of subtle things, I feel like Glitchless sort of embodies subtle <laughs> when it comes to OOT. Um, there's a lot of extremely minor movement and optimizations that Danny B is doing that, like, I'm probably missing because I don't run this at the same level. Um, glitchless in particular, Every second really, really matters. Um, maybe Danny B can talk a little bit more about that when he gets a chance. But first, we have to skip another owl, so yep. a little bit of serious time. Oh. Almost got it. Yeah. If you can make it past the uh, black transition there inside the tree stump, then he'll not talk to you. So because we didn't, uh, or yeah, because we didn't skip this owl, he won't be here later. So we can come back through. But if you skipped him, he'll still be there, and you'll have to make your way around. So I got one more chance for an owl skip uh, right after Saria's song. So this wolf can be a bit of a troll, depending if he stays in this corner, which he did. That's good. Careful. Should be fine. Sometimes the game stops you when you go into narrow hallways because the camera kind of can't handle it. So. so maybe we can take this cutscene and talk a little bit about glitch lists and getting good runs and being close to some of best. Yeah, sure. So in this category, well, first I just want to mention the really intrusive take a stick here. That's the best part. <laughs> So this category is really long. Um, my sum of best in this is mid-334. Uh, my PB is 338.21, uh, which is 11 seconds off the current record, which is held by Mackay. Um, and so that's less than four minutes. A uh, good run, a really good run in this category, you want to aim for less than three minutes off your sum of best. Uh, and that's a really small amount of time for such a long category. Uh, so most things in this category aren't ridiculously tough. Um, but natural time loss, just by you know not being perfect, is something that happens all the time. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> so the final owl skip coming up. Of course, that death was intentional. It gets me back to the start of this area a little bit faster than walking there. Dang. Oh, All close. right. Well, at least so I got close. one. That was my goal, is to show it off one time. And that one's rather tricky because you run out of the loading zone pretty much no matter what. And his trigger is right there. So if you shield and hold down, he'll stop your momentum so you can set up for it. So now we're going back to uh, Darunia to get the Goron bracelet. I think this might be my favorite cutscene. Dancing Darunia. It's pretty glorious. <laughs> so when I entered this cutscene, uh, I think I failed it, but if you enter this cutscene with a really particular uh, walking angle, when the cutscene is over and you're talking to Darunia, um, the camera can lock in a position that's facing Link instead of behind him and it sort of faces you directly to the exit, and so it's a little bit faster to do so. Um, but I think my angle is off here, so you'll notice the camera pan around to the back of Link, probably. And th those sort of tiny optimizations are what allows Danny B to play so close to some of the best oh, it works. across, Fine. like, almost four hours. And yeah, just to compare, so Glitchless aims to be about three minutes to some of best, 100% for which the record is just over four hours, I think is like six minutes over some of best or something like that. So it matters. All right, so Dodongo's Cavern's coming up, which is a, my favorite child dungeon. It's pretty good. Hello, Torch. <laughs> I love the sound of the Gorons getting up. <laughs> so getting that backflip there, Obviously, saves a little bit of time because I can be down here and enter Dodongo's Cavern. You have a few frames to get it. So here comes the first cutscene skip of the run. Uh, when you blow up this wall, there's a cutscene that shows you the inside of Dodongo's Cavern. The camera pans around. We're not going to watch it, I hope. And this is a relatively recent addition to the run. Despite it being nice. pretty simple. So like I said, abusing death to skip a cutscene is not allowed, but uh, if you can just do something normal like leave an area or jump into a void as a cutscene starts, then that's totally fine. So this dungeon contains some of the most dangerous enemies in the game, fire keys. Fire keys are the worst. And that's why we got the Hylian Shield for safety, because the Deku Shield can burn, and if it burns, it's big time loss. So. Mostly because we can't do Power Crouch stabs, which is so integral to fighting, and that's the thing where we store damage value. Uh, so if you notice, I slashed my Deku Stick right before the bomb blew up uh, a couple seconds ago. So that stored two damage uh, to my stabs. And so Lizalfos are coming up, and the way Lizalfos work is they each have six health, and there are two of them. And the moment you do half of one's health, which is three, he'll run away and replace with the other guy. But if I can do two health and then four, he'll die without ever running away. So there's two, jump across, store four with a jump slash, and then kill him to six. And that allows me to uh, kill both without one ever running away, which is a lot faster. Yeah, if you've ever fought these guys casually, you know they can be a real pain, and you just chase them around the room and burn lots and lots of time. So I want to talk about the Dodongos and the thing <laughs> that happened recently. 
Oh yeah, if you feed a Dodongo a bomb chew, the game overflows memory or something, and it can randomly crash, or it can unload half the game or something. It's and really it's strange. Really freaky, yeah. And the fact that we only found it recently makes no sense. So I have my sword in hand right now. I'm going to switch to Deku Stick. And the reason for that is when I pick up a bomb flower, which I'm going to do in a second, um, if I have nothing in my hand, it's fast. If I have a sword in my hand, it's slow. If I have Deku Stick in my hand, it's medium. And putting away sword means you have to stay still for a few seconds, so just switch to Deku Stick because that's fast. There's a small optimization there where we pick a bomb up and then replace it so that the explosion chain isn't broken. Shoutouts to OT3D. <laughs> Pretty sure that was their strat. Yeah, that's where I got it from. Uh, so normally there's a, a red rupee in a pot here. It's worth 20. Normally I would get it, but because I already got the shield and my rupee route set, I won't need it. So I'm going to skip this pot here. This upcoming room has fire keys, so... Fire keys are bad. Nice. Nice. So what he did with backflipping on the Armos, the Armos is kind of circular, and so Link can kind of just clip up onto it because Child Link can jump really, really high in comparison to Adult Link. Uh, okay. A little bit scary. <laughs> so there's a Navi Tech trigger here. I'm going to stop just short of it, wait for this guy, and then backflip over it so I don't have to talk to Navi. Dang. Little movement set up there to make sure that sticks on the ledge. See if I can get it this time. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, so here we go. This is fun. I don't have slingshot, which means I can't get rid of these, fl these flames, so I won't. And of course, if he messes that up, he loses his shield. So the stakes are pretty high. I'm kind of hoping I get hearts from one of these guys, because health's getting low. No hearts, OK. So you might have noticed Danny B kind of waited a moment to crouch stab that was Elphos. Uh, those guys have weird invincibility frames that can be a little bit tricky to deal with sometimes. Uh, if you stab them while certain animations are happening, they just don't take damage. Nice. Sweet. That side hop across the two flame platforms is a little weird because the ledge kind of stops you from going too far, and then you can walk back. Because if you're positioned incorrectly, you'll just side hop straight into the flame. Now we have right. bombs. Bombs are really useful. The bomb route's a little tight in this category. All right, so coming up in the following rooms, after I blow up the skull, um, there's a lot of camera manipulation to keep the keys off me until I want them to be near me so I can stun them like all at once or avoid them entirely. Nice bonk. First bonk of the run, not bad. So we're going to enter this room, turn away, and not even look into the center so those keys don't come for us. And then back here... I'm going to jump. Hopefully and they both notice me at the same time now. Yep. Good. Nice. So if something was going to go wrong with Keese, I think it might probably would have been there. I think that's where I've seen you lose the shield the most. Though this next room can be a little dodgy too. So this next room I can't do anything about the Keese, so I'm just going to listen close and use Deku Nuts if I need to.
All right, I got super lucky there. That's good. <laughs> and you can side out before that block falls, but it's kind of tight. Small optimizations. So he, st he stored damage there again. So he has four damage stored for the boss fight. I think this is just about the easiest boss in the entire game. Yeah. So just because, uh, like I said, the bomb count is a little tight in this run, uh, instead of using my own bomb here, I'm just gonna use a bomb flyer. And that's it. Tough fight. <laughs> so far, these bosses, not very challenging. Baronade's a little more interesting, the one in Jabu coming up next. There's a small optimization with that fight that Danny B actually loves to tell people. And that is, you speedrunners out there who play OOT, don't wait to hear the breath noise. You can throw the bomb a little bit earlier and save fractions of a second. There's another small optimization that I tried to do and didn't. Um, Right after you stab him the last time, if you press A at the right time, you can put away your sword uh, as he's dying. And that saved me from having to put away my sword when I pick up that heart container right there. So that saves like two frames. Yeah, we talk about saving small things a lot, but this run is nearly four hours long. So it, it definitely adds up. This cutscene's good too. Anything with Darunia. <laughs> Except the conversation at Friday. All right, so coming up next, uh, we're gonna go do the Zora's River segments. Um, so first thing we need to do is get the silver scale so that we can dive to the bottom of Lake Hylia and get the letter in a bottle. Um, excuse me, that's the only letter, that's the only bottle we're gonna get in the whole run. There are four, but we only need one. Yeah, the bottle's one of the most broken items in this game, but clutchless. Alright, red gem acquired. So we got some pretty self-explanatory movement coming up, so if you have donations, go for it. We do, and we're going to hop back just a minute because we have a donation from the Boyk's mom. So if the Boyks is out there, your mom thinks you did a great job. She donated $25 and says, great run of Pepsi Man. It was exciting to watch. Another awesome GDQ event for an awesome charity. Keep up the good work. It's always so sweet when the family donates. I love it. <laughs> I think it's the cutest. All right, we have an anonymous $100 donation. I don't think there's any game I loved as much as a kid than Ocarina of Time. And the realization that you can skip that owl has ruined my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> we have an anonymous $50 donation. Good morning, SGDQ. I have been awaiting this moment, running Ocarina of Time glitchless. This game took me through a very rough time, so to the runner Danny B, many, many thanks for a glitchless run of Zelda. I look forward to the for, forward for a three-hour run of nostalgia. To the entire community, runners, audience, and all of the crew making this possible, $50 to runner's choice. We have a $50 donation from Navi and Fee Fusion. Hey, listen! I must tell you everything you already know. Doctors Without Borders <laughs> is an amazing cause and GDQs get more and more awesome every year. If you will excuse me, I need to figure out how I can insert my special brand of annoyance into Breath of the Wild. Okay. So this owl, I hate this owl. This is the worst owl because these rocks are terrible. They seemingly randomly blow up. This one should work. Yeah, this one should work. But I spent about five hours trying to figure out a consistent way to get past it this owl. Work. With the owl <laughs> exactly. <laughs> with the owl scope. To come to the conclusion that for some weird reason, if you're holding an item in your hand, like a sword or a stick, and that owl catches you and he flies away, the camera will follow him for about 15 more seconds than it should. 
So I've got this Kuko here. Some of you might be wondering why. All will be explained in about 30 seconds. Or is River Cuckoo best Cuckoo? And so normally rolling is fast, but we can't roll with the Cuckoo, so backwalking even shorter distances is faster. Alright, so normally you're supposed to play Zelda's Lullaby to open this waterfall, but if you have a little flying friend, this is pretty easy. That saves about 10 seconds, even though the movement is slow, carrying it all the way up the river since you can't do normal fast movement. Uh, the cutscene of opening that waterfall takes about a year and a half, so saves a bunch of time. So side hopping is actually extra powerful if you're on slopes. Um, so if I'm, I have a long slope, I'm going to try to side hop up it. All right, let's hope for good RNG. Yeah, so the placement of these five rupees is going to be entirely random. It can take anywhere between one and five dives to get them all. So three would be nice. Wow, that looks... That's not so bad. Yeah. Please? Nice, okay, nice. good. So this is two dives, which is really nice. Don't usually count the one off the waterfall. It is possible to do it in one, but it takes a special throw. Yeah, so two dives is really good. I'd also like to point out that Zora has no concept of economy because you pay him 20 rupees and he throws 25. <laughs> I'm stock up on Deka Nuts here. Deka Nuts are really important because they're super strong. And I swear, like, no casual player ever really knows how powerful Deka Nuts are. I know I didn't. And when I started speedrunning this game and I realized just how strongly we're it uh, sort of blew my mind a little bit. You'll see a lot of that in, uh, especially Forest Temple later. Get the letter in the bottle that Rudo left for some reason. Right here. All right, so we're coming up on what I consider to be the most important cutscene in the game. <laughs> yep. It's very important for all the chat to spam as hard as you possibly can Danny Mweep. That's M-W-E-E-P, capital D, capital M. <laughs> Start right now. So King Zora... Because I have nothing better to do in this cutscene, I know that he weeps 25 times. And <laughs> coincidentally, 25 is exactly the number in a five layer weep pyramid. So, so not to encourage spam, but I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> Here we go. Weep, weep, weep. Weep, 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 All right, so we need this fish here. Otherwise, side the whale won't eat us. Yeah, side hopping downstairs is fast. And while he was in midair, he drew the bottle, so he didn't have to put away the sword. So getting into Jabu is kind of interesting, because it's actually really easy to get in here if uh, you use a clip. But that's a clip, so we can't do it. All right, so Jabu is a good time to talk about the changes that Glitchless has undergone recently. Um, so for a long time, Glitchless had a pretty stagnant rule set. Uh, and last year, last summer, um, me and a few other people 
decided we wanted to try to change some of the rules uh, to make it into a little bit of a more modern category. Um, and a big thing in this dungeon that sort of spawned the whole discussion was that uh, you can actually use a bomb to damage boost yourself from the elevator over to the blue switch before Baronade. Uh, and I'll, I'll point out where I'm talking about in a minute or two. But um, so that whole that damage boost skips about half this dungeon, skips about three minutes and ten seconds of this dungeon. So actually, give me a second here. Once again, we don't have slingshot, so. Oh, that didn't work. That was... Shabombs, please. There okay, we go. here we go. Yeah, bubbles are called shabombs, and floating skeletons are called bubbles. <laughs> Just so you guys know. So this elevator to my right here is what I'm talking about. When I come back with boomerang, uh, I'm going to jump from that elevator with a bomb and ex hopefully explode myself to the other side uh, without having to jump from the top and lower the whole extra platform. Um, and so that was actually banned for a long time because of how much of this dungeon it skips. But that sort of went against the whole feel of the category, which, which according to everything else was, it doesn't really matter what you skip as long as you skip it without using glitches. Um, and so that underwent a long discussion and so it eventually got added to the category and made this dungeon from probably one of the most boring to one of the most exciting. It was also one of the worst because before you had to cut down all those tentacles in the back with the boomerang, and those are the trolliest enemies in the entire game. Yeah, so we've replaced bad enemies with uh, skillful hard trick. and technical trick, <laughs> yeah. which is always a good trade-off. Exactly. Uh, so some other things that got changed... Oh my god, bubbles, please. Some other things that got changed along with the damage boost becoming allowed... Um, are save warps. And save warps were banned in this category for a long time because back in the day, runs needed to be done in single segment. And of course, glitchless is a very old category because it's one of the first categories you can actually do if you want to speedrun a game. Um, and so save warping is now allowed, which is a good thing. Don't forget the thing. The thing? The mega flip. Oh, the thing. Nice. <laughs> so my run is now invalid because I did a glitch. That's not how that works. Also, that Octorok dropped a bomb in the water, and I'm really sad that I can't get it. <laughs> wow. Ruta, come on. Nice. nice. <laughs> All right, it's just like with the chicken, backwalking is uh, faster because we can't roll, but this is long enough that you pretty much want to backwalk anyway. So I'm actually going to skip using the bomb strat here because the bomb failed on the boulders. I'm going to save my bombs. Normally what I do in this uh, upcoming room is use a bomb to kill one of the stingrays. What are they even called? Stingers? I think so. Um, but uh, because I wasted a bomb on those boulders because they're dumb and didn't blow up, I'm going to not do that. And so I'll just use Rudo's butt instead. And the switch, actually. Oh, Rudo's butt didn't work. The one thing Rudo is good for, and she couldn't even handle it. All right, so coming up is what I consider to be the hardest single trick in the game. Or in, not in the game, but in the <laughs> run. <laughs> um, my PB failed it once and lost 40 seconds, and I'm only 11 seconds off the record, so it was pretty heartbreaking. So if I get it here, that'd be good. I've got a backup, but uh, it would be nice to be able to show off the real trick. We were talking about versions earlier, and he's going to do a little setup here. You can't do this on 1.0 because you can open the sides of these doors on 1.0. Oh, yes! Good. Okay, there's a ton of stuff to explain there, but first the switch. Uh, the switch is actually close enough to the door that you can just roll and open the door. You don't have to bring the box. It is a frame perfect trick, though. Yeah, yeah it is frame perfect. But the jump. Okay, so 
you run forward to pull a bomb at the correct time because you have to jump at the very peak of that elevator. And then he pause buffers. So pausing the game, we can, with, well, with good timing, we can advance the game one frame and input uh, buffer inputs in the unpause light. So he's doing that and correcting his angle. And then on the correct frame, we'll drop the bomb and jump slash, which gives you just enough height with the jump slash, the jump, and the bomb throwing you, which is completely intended by the developers to barely cross that gap. And we found that, or shout outs to Alien Squeaky Toy, I guess, because he re-found that trick about, I don't know, what, 18 months ago or something. And it turns out that the community had known about that trick for a really long time, but because it was banned and glitchless, and that was the only category that was ever going to use it, we never knew about it. So I'm rolling into Baronade here, because when it burrows, it waits to damage you before it gets up again. And so I can roll into it to just force it to get up again. That was a pretty solid fight. That was a clean yeah. fight, yeah. That's one of those fights where if it's clean, it's super fast, but if it goes wrong, it can burn a lot of time fast. Yeah, because those jellyfish that you didn't really see much of, <laughs> um, if you stun, if you throw the boomerang at exactly the right time, uh, you can kind of make them all stun at once, and then a Dekanut kills them all at once. Um, and if you do that twice, you never have to do any of the spilling, spinning jellyfish phases, which are the time killers. Tiny optimization with that blue warp. When you walk into it, Link turns and faces Rudo. So if you're already facing Rudo, when you step into it, it takes less time. Whereas if you're facing like completely away from her, it actually takes an eternity for Link to turn all the way around. All right, and that was the child dungeons. That was not so bad. I guess Deku Tree was the messiest of them, but overall that was pretty good. Um, but we got a little bit of cutscene here, so donations are definitely welcome. Yes, we just received a five thousand dollar. All right. Five thousand dollar. Anonymous donation. Wow. wow. Here, th and this is the best part. Here's two thousand dollars for saving the animals, and three thousand for killing them. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> and then we have another one thousand anonymous dollar donation. <laughs> Getting the big money here. And this donation, it's all the comment says is runner's choice. So you got a lot of money to worry about there. <laughs> And then we have a $400 donation from Barry Kramer, longtime watcher, first time donator. Thanks for being the best distraction from work. Save the frame, save the animals, save Hyrule, save Ganon. Man, I don't know, save everything. <laughs> so that's the first save warp in the run. You go back to Link's house here, it's faster. So that garbled text on screen, um, that's because my game is in Japanese, but my Wii is not, and so it doesn't really know how to display Japanese characters, so it just gives us garbage. We have a $25 donation from Revere saying, I'm just here for the meat. Seriously, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> and there was a poker tournament in the board game room and we, the donation just got submitted. $340, we played poker for it. And the comment says, from winning the poker tournament, this donation is going to naming Shadow Bob Chase for Bob Chase. <laughs> so thanks to everybody who played poker this afternoon. It was a lot of fun. A $100 donation from Ray's Man. Greetings from Belgium. It's just over 6 a.m. here, and after a few weeks of piling up sleep deprivation, a smart man probably wouldn't get out of bed for a speed run. Me, on the other hand, here I am. Quick question for the runner, or basically all runners, are you still capable of playing these games casually? <laughs> no. Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> no worth <close. laughs> Well, there's your answer. <laughs> We have an anonymous $100 donation. Here's $1 for every gold Skulltula. You don't need to kill them, so kill the animals instead. <laughs> so speedrunning is sort of a, a means of playing a game more after you can't play it casually anymore because you've done so too much. Yeah, so if you're considering speedrunning, be prepared to never go back to the game the way you think of it now because it's going to change completely. 
I would like to point out during this cutscene that Zelda is the most boss thrower of all time. She launches this thing. <laughs> we have a $100 donation from Rachel200. Since Ocarina of Time is coming up soon, I wanted to make this donation in honor of Narcissa Wright, whose legendary runs first got me into speedrunning and GDQ. I've definitely donated way more to charity than I would have without her influence. If you're listening, Narcissa, you are my hero. A $50 donation from Recon Dingo. Ocarina of Time is one of my all-time favorite, all favorite games. Let's get that glitch exhibition, exhibition going. I will not live that down, I swear. <laughs> A $100 donation, dollar donation from Amanda154. Here is $100 to the Zelda Glitch Exhibition, a perfect companion to a run with no glitches. Thank you to the runners and event organizers. A $123.45 donation from Zunk Funk, having a blast watching this year's SGDQ. I will be watching this run, sipping on some cr crystal Pepsi. This donation is for the Zelda Glitch Run. Don't stop running and don't stop the donations. Please don't stop the donations. Remembering that we are donating for Doctors Without Borders and we have lots of great incentives. We're still working on that Pokemon Blue Reverse Badge order. We still need over $40,000. I know I'm excited to see it. That's what my reader's choice is going for and I don't know if anyone else is doing the same. So let's get those donations in. So our Ocarina just got upgraded from brown to blue, which is really cool. Um, <laughs> there's actually absolutely no difference between the two. Um, you don't need uh, this except to learn Song of Time, which is necessary for this run. And, and Glitches is kind of long, so there's a subcategory, sort of, of child dungeons, which ends when you hold the ocarina over your head. Yeah, I have the best time for that. It's an hour, 39 minutes, or 39 point seconds, point. rather. Yeah. So heading to the adult part of this game, the, uh, the adult cutscene is about four minutes long. It's uh, every run that isn't any percent basically has to deal with it. It's uh, kind of annoying, but it's a necessary evil to get to the adult section, which I find way more fun. Me too. So normally uh, in a run where I'm actually gunning for a really good time, this is where I would buy the Hylian Shield if I hadn't already. Um, but since we did that, just go straight to Temple of Time. It saves about eight seconds to buy it now instead of earlier. Mostly because uh, when I got the rupees on the chains earlier, outside the, outside the castle, I had to reload the field in order to make the rupees respawn so I could get them again. Uh, and that's a big portion of why it's really slow. This is the cutscene most categories don't watch, but it's a good cutscene. Yeah, door time skip skip takes about an hour to set up. Yes, Navi, we know it's the Master Sword Pedestal. So something about adult. If you played this game casually, you will know that Navi points you in the direction of some dungeons along with some other NPCs. 
And normally you do them in the order of forest, fire, and then water temple. And then spirit and shadow are interchangeable technically, but Navi points you towards shadow first. But in this run, we're actually gonna do fire temple first after doing some collection. And it's because it turns out to be faster for various reasons. And that route order came about relatively recently. Right. Um, Danny B mentioned in Jabu Jabu that we rearranged some of the rules. Uh, we allowed save warping. Um, and at that time, we sort of reevaluated things. And it turned out that going to fire first was faster. Yeah, and that's directly because of save warping. The ability to change your position in the overworld. As adult, you save warp back to Temple of Time, or in, as child, you save warp back to Link's house. Um, that ability cuts out some overworld movement, and turned out that shuffling the dungeons around was actually faster. Uh, and Fire Temple first is faster by the length of playing Bolero, which is the warp to nearby Fire Temple one time, which is 19 seconds. This guy has a Triforce on his forehead. <laughs> <laughs> and it may or may not have been intentional. <laughs> Pierced his ear, gave him tights. I don't know what was going on here, but... It's been a crazy seven years. <laughs> I actually find it really interesting in a game this old that uh, you could do dynamic lighting off Navi like that. So the very first thing we're going to do when we regain control here is we're going to go get the hookshot. Probably the most important adult item. Almost every single category goes to get hookshot like right away. Um, and... So the Dempe race, which is how you get hookshot, you race the Grave Digger in the, in the grave. And the best time that a human can do is 46 seconds. Uh, best time that I've done is 47. Most people can do 47. Uh, and a few people can do 46. Uh, I've never gotten 46, and it's really tough. You need to avoid all the flames, which are completely random in where they drop and when they drop. Uh, and also you need really good movement. I think Torja is on the couch, gotten 46 a few times, right? Yeah, <laughs> three times. No, wait, what a, four? What a Something boss. like that. <laughs> it's actually really hard. It's I've true. played a lot of Ocarina of Time, and yeah. I also have not gotten a 46. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one. <laughs> wait. All right, very mysterious character here. <laughs> it's clearly chic. I mean, come on. Who else could it be? It's probably Darunia in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very... Pepsi man. <laughs> Pepsi. <laughs> I, I heard somebody. <laughs> the colors are right. That's true. All right, we're back. I think this screen is one of the most striking images to play casually. If you've never seen this game before, because just everything's barren and Death Mountain's on fire. coming in here. Can I get some in before you, Reese? Sure. Yeah, go for it. Awesome. We have a $50 donation from Mini Bees. Hey, listen! 
<laughs> I have been watching your stream for years. I was there when you won the glitchless world record against Mekai, and I will be there when you dethrone Mekai again here at GDQ. Danny, keep doing an awesome <laughs> job and continue to promote sweet earning on the best game ever made. Kill the animals, save the frame. Frames. We have a $50 donation from Secretly of Velociraptor. Love Ocarina of Time, love GDQ. Good luck, Danny B. Let's get that Glitch Expo goal met, which we did. And an anonymous $100 donation, donating for more glitches and more animals, ideally saved. So you notice I use that Poe to kind of boost me off the grave. As long as I pull the grave for a second, it'll keep going even if I get off it. So it lets me get into the grave a little faster. Right, make your Dante bets now. Fifty-nine. Dang. <laughs> Somebody's got no faith. No faith. <laughs> so one thing to watch out for is those doors. If I happen to get a flame that boosts me back through a door as I'm going through, uh, the game will actually void me out, and that's really Aww. not good. Aww. We'll pretend you were on 46 space. That ruined <laughs> it. Little trick here. You can jump slash up that ledge. The corners of some ledges are a little messed up. In that, like when you climb, or when you go to climb them, Link just pops up into the air right away, um, and so that's what happened there. All right, so 49. That's about right. Each flame usually costs about two seconds, so one flame, 49. That's about right for yeah. for me. 47 pace. 49 with the flame is really solid. And then, like Danny just said about the doors voiding out, uh, if we go through this door right here past the hookshot chest, you'll be behind uh, two Song of Time blocks, which we actually have the Song of Time, so it'd be fine, but it goes to Kakariga Village, and it's kind of slow to go that way. Yeah, go so I'm going to use that on purpose to yeah. void out. And go back to the beginning of this area. All right, so now for the worst equip in the game. Getting to hookshot here is really annoying. <laughs> in Majora's Mask, um, the way the pause menu works is each slot is highlightable, even if you don't have the item in that slot. In OOT, it's not like that at all. Um, you can only highlight the items that you have. And so if you have very few items, like I do right now, sometimes navigating the menu can be really difficult. There are certain situations, not in this run, but in speedrunning this game in general, where you won't be able to navigate your menu because you don't have items in the right places, so the cursor can't move correctly. All right, so magic is the next stop. Well, this jump. We have to do this jump first. That's true. This is the ledge. We just call it the ledge. There we go. Sometimes that's really annoying. Yeah. So if you notice, I just put hookshot in my hand by pressing hookshot and flicking shield to cancel actually pulling out the hookshot. Um, putting hookshot in my hand now uh, prevents me from having to put it in my hand when I actually need it, which is right about now. Uh, so that saves about two frames. We call that a quick draw. Um, and I'll be doing it every time I have a chance to pull a weapon early. Uh, and if I do that a lot, it'll save actual significant time over the course of the run. Ideally, that Skultula wouldn't be looking at us. If he is like he was just there, it's quicker to side hop to the right rather than try to make him attack and miss or something like that. So we're playing on Japanese because it's faster. But on English, there's a weird little thing that part of this text after you get magic is skippable for one frame. I don't know why. Yeah, if you input uh, the B button on like one frame right before a bunch of text boxes, all the text boxes will just scroll through really fast. Good fairy design right there. Yeah, not exactly G-rated. <laughs> <laughs> Dem polygons. Dem 
All right, so we're coming up on the second damage boost that we're going to see. Uh, I'm going to enter Death Mountain Crater from here. Uh, and if you're familiar, you might know that you're not really supposed to get to the other side of Death, of, uh, the Death Mountain Crater from here. But uh, with a damage boost, we can. It's not that hard. This damage boost is actually really precise, but the setup works perfectly. And it ends up being really, really easy. It's unfortunate that it's so precise because we've tried to find a faster setup for this, and it just nothing is consistent. Now, we talked about this a little bit in Jabu, but I'll mention it again since there will be people who are watching who are going to think this is a glitch. Um, and the thing with damage boosts is that the developers made and intended for bombs to push you. All right, the explosion is supposed to throw you through the air. So we're using that intended mechanic in a way they didn't think of, but it's not a glitch. Yeah, yeah and so that's, that highlights the difference between a glitch and an exploit. Right. <laughs> this is my favorite music in the game. So Bolero is probably one of the most important songs because warping here allows you to get to Goron City, which in turn allows you to get to the Death Mountain area, or uh, if you use the shortcut, you can get back to Lost Woods. Oh, <laughs> Ocarina's hard. <laughs> and you have C buttons. You have no excuse. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, playing songs on the N64 controller is generally easier. If you guys notice, I'm probably playing songs faster than most people are used to. Uh, and that's because C buttons are a lot easier to play songs than the C stick on the GameCube controller. So we're about to walk through uh, Goron City to get to Lost Woods, but Darunia's door is actually closed. But that's fine because it doesn't have collision on the side that we're going that we're approaching from, and it's the same as Bridge Clip. You can just walk through it, so there's no big deal. Yes, yeah, so we're coming up on Ice Cavern, which is uh, one of my favorite places in the run. It's really cool and glitchless. We're gonna abuse the heck out of ice physics. Also, another quick draw here. Save the frames. This is pretty basic movements. I think you have time for some donations, actually. I have a super long one, but trust me, it's worth it. Okay. It's a $10 anonymous donation. Four swords and an oracle of ages ago, we encountered Link's awakening. Through a link to the past, we see our hero don Majora's mask, the Minish cap, and a phantom hourglass. This wind waker gazes up at a skyward sword forever looking up to his twilight princess. By the oracle of seasons, we will never forget his spirit tracks. The adventure of Link will always follow us between our Link Between Worlds. May we always be able to call upon our Triforce hero, our Hyrule warrior, as we face Ganon's wrath. We look forward to a fresh breath of the wild, but we will never forget the legend of Zelda and all the memories it holds dear. dear. Thank you, SGDQ, for all the good that you show the world so that we can all someday be heroes to someone in need. That was, that was an awesome, awesome donation. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so in the theme of, con or in the continuing theme of casual players underrating items, Farrar's Wind is also very powerful. Yeah, Farrar's Wind is like the bread and butter of glitchless dungeons. Uh, in the adult section, we're going to abuse all the dungeons pretty much with Farrah's Wind. F uh, fire, water, forest. Um, in Shadow, I'm going to use it once when I don't usually. Spirit is the only one where we don't use Farrah's Wind at all. For anybody out there who doesn't know what Farrah's Wind <laughs> does, <laughs> um, it's teleportation magic. So you set it and then you can use it to uh, move about the dungeon. Yeah, you can set it you can only set it in dungeons, so in anything that's considered a dungeon by the game, and then you can only use it again in dungeons, so you can warp between, uh, or warp inside the same dungeon or between dungeons, actually. Yeah, so you set one warp point, and the warp point gets set in the room you're currently in uh, from the door you entered from, and then at any point while you're in a dungeon, you can go back to that one warp point, uh, or you can clear it and set a new one if you want.
And we needed magic before we got this, because if you go to any of the fairy fountains that give you these magic spells, before you get magic, it just won't do anything. All right, small swim, and then one of the best parts of the run, in my opinion. Definitely. We have a $150 donation from Scald with a really good suggestion. Maybe Sheik is the owl. Ooh. I hadn't thought of that, actually. We need to find some Sheik skips now. Yep. <laughs> Alright, so in particular, the last room of Ice Cavern is pretty cool and glitchless. But it's all pretty fun, it's all hard. Yeah, this area is really short, but it's one of the more technical part of the parts of the run. Bombs? No bombs. It's okay. Those guys have a small chance of dropping bombs. So we're collecting these rupees to open this door up here to go to the back room and collect blue fire. So one thing I need to pay attention to is Fire Temple's coming up next. Uh, and Fire Temple, like we said, has the whole health aspect where I'm not going to get the Goron Tunic. Uh, and so all the heat timers in all those rooms are going to be based on uh, how much health I have. So I'm going to try to maintain high health here, even though it's really hard with all the ice enemies. There's a little more mechanic camera manipulation in this room. It's very subtle. Nice, made that jump. Sometimes he grabs that ledge, and it make, means you're almost certainly going to get hit by the size keys. But uh, if you make it up that ledge without grabbing, you can get away. Nice. Nice. Uh, don't do it. No. no. Oh, oh, wow. Please. please. <laughs> so powerful. See, our elemental keys are the worst enemies in every game ever. All right, so this room coming up is the fun one. Uh, There's this really big block puzzle to get more silver rupees in order to leave the room, but uh, I'm not going to push any of the blocks. Nope. I will climb on one one time, though. Right, this first one you can just jump to. And then right here... We're going to get an angle, and then, nice. So you build up momentum. So you build up momentum by backwalking, and then the way the ledges work is Ooh. you jump off of them in whatever direction it thinks you're going. And right there, because he's kind of moonwalking, it thinks he's going forward. So he's going backwards towards the ledge, and then walks forward. Or no. jumps forward. Uh. No. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god. That was supposed to be a quick spin. <laughs> that was almost disaster, because if I had actually gone in there, uh, that would have sent me back to the beginning of Ice Cavern. Everything would have already been done, but uh, I still would have had to traverse it again. Can you climb that, please? That would be nice. There we go. All right, so getting up here is the final little challenge. So messy room, those keys were not very nice to me, but uh, that's okay. It's mostly RNG. I didn't handle it the best, but luck could have definitely been nicer. So I'm going to get these two heart pots uh, just to fill up for Fire Temple. And then this fight is really hard. <laughs> best boss. So that guy, Wolfos in general, actually take double damage if you hit them in the butt. So. Uh, if you can stun them and get around them fast enough, you can kill them really fast. So we get a cutscene here, so more donations are cool. Yeah, certainly. We have a $512 donation from J Broman. Yeah, that's good. Donations are good. Had 
to donate during the Ocarina of Time run, I'm going to take the announcer's recommendation and put this towards the Pokemon Blue Reverse Badge Order run. And I read that so I can give you an update. We still need just under $39,000 for that. So, let's keep going. <laughs> We do have a, another big donation, though, a $1,000 donation. This one's from Rhea C. Although I'm only a recent viewer of GDQs, I've been entranced by it far more than is good for my health. Thank you all for your hard work in creating these fantastic streams. Blue is the superior color of most anything, so please put this towards reverse badging the blues. I concur. One exception. <laughs> tunics. Blue tunic, worst tunic. Give you that Best one. Best tunic. <laughs> <laughs> we have a $200 anonymous donation. So glad the glitch exhibition, sorry announcer, got met. <laughs> Rip my sleep schedule. And hey, I said it right that time because I cracked it in my head. <laughs> so this room is really cool. If you didn't notice the walls, Nintendo just decided to go a little bit crazy. But it's really pretty. I think you're supposed to be inside of a crystal or something, but you know, looks cool. In the beta version of this room, there's actually a gigantic throne made of red ice in the place of where that treasure chest is. It's really cool. All right, fire temple. So, so you notice the timer on the screen right now? That's because this room is considered hot. And the way that works is you get one second per quarter heart. Per eighth. Per eighth, sorry, yeah. So eight seconds per full heart. And it's per filled up hearts, not heart containers. So health management will come into play. And, uh, for the majority of the rooms, it's really not too big a deal. Uh, the timers aren't too threatening. But there's one really big room in Fire Temple where it can be close. And at the very end, when we fight Volvagia, it can be quite scary. Uh, we need enough time to complete that fight. Luckily, there's a pretty cool way to beat her, but uh, or him, I'm not sure. <laughs> but we'll explain that later when it comes to it. So we have to collect these keys from these trapped Goron while not talking to the Goron because they talk for a long time. Yeah, something I didn't know when I played this casually is you totally don't need to talk to these guys. They're perfectly capable of finding the exit by themselves. More uh, jump slash for extra distance. So this is the large room that uh, where the timer is important. This one and the next one. So one thing that uh, is interesting about the timer is that if you pull out a cutscene item midair, or if you try to, like ocarina or a bottled item or Din's fire or Ferris wind, anything that starts a cutscene when you press when you press it. Uh, it actually pauses the timer until you hit the ground. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. Maybe the game's trying to queue up the cutscene, but uh, you can use that to extend your time a little bit. So camera manipulation here. Yep. Going to load these blocks at the right time to start their movement cycle in a time that is beneficial to me so that I can make this cycle across the room without jumping in the lava. And something about that ledge climb that a lot of people don't know, uh, casual or oh. start just starting to speedrun. I just grabbed this edge. <laughs> uh, interesting thing is that if you... Hello, Keese. If you uh, end a roll on the same frame that Link is supposed to jump, he actually gets zero speed and grabs the edge instead. Yeah, and about grabbing edges, if you walk up to them and press A, you'll climb instantly. And that's actually required to get through that room the way he did. So when he jumps off this ledge, watch the timer. Watch the timer here. I'm going to press Farah's Wind. It disappears until I hit the ground. Uh, one thing to know, though, is that the moment you press a cutscene that in midair, you can't actually change your momentum anymore, and you're locked to whatever path you had. Um, so if you need to curve a jump at all, you shouldn't do that. So this is where, if things were to go wrong and get messy, the timer could potentially be scary. He has plenty of time, but... If he missed that jump, or if the keys messed with him, or something strange, uh, this would wear, be where trouble would come in. That jump right there is where most people learn about the cutscene momentum thing. <laughs> yeah, because I need to hold back to land on that block. 
So if I were to press Ferris Wind, I would get locked jumping really far forward and miss. All right, so there's another theme in this run that we don't like block puzzles, so we're not going to do this one either. Nice. So it gets right on the edge and then jumps and curves it back. Boulder Maze is kind of interesting because with proper movement you can get through it cleanly. Like the cycles all work out. Kinda like that. Yep. More keys. So you gotta be careful when I'm rolling in these cells because if I roll at the wrong time, I'll talk to the Goron instead. And all those Gorons talk for like at least, I don't know, a decade or so. So it's really bad to avoid, or really, really bad to talk to them. Because there are what, eight that I talk to? I think I skipped one. Yeah, I think you skipped one. Yeah, the one on top of the one on So, health management, but I'm running through lava. Um, <laughs> it's generally okay to lose some health here because we're coming up on a section where we can refill. And the lava is by far the shortest path through that room. And something interesting about uh, health is that if you're on fire, there's a thing you can get called glitched health where you actually have eighths of hearts, which it doesn't show in the game, but can actually happen. But that affects the timer since it runs on eights. So, so we, that, that big fence there, no one wants to climb it. So Ferris Wind is a really good way to skip it. And that came about with the recent route change with uh, Save Warps. I'm gonna get this heart. Normally I would skip it, but I wanna be full health. Make sure I'm full health at the end. So this next room is pretty interesting. Uh, these firewalls aren't the best. They're awful. The They're game. programmed really badly. <laughs> They're too far from the walls. Yeah. Um, so this whole maze is completely broken, as you'll see in a second. Not supposed to be able to go through here, but it's pretty easy. Or there, but it's pretty easy. <laughs> And then I'm not supposed to be able to go through here, but if I use invincibility frames, I can go right through. Nice. So sorry to anybody who spent hours of their childhood <laughs> stuck in that maze. So now I'm at full health. Bomb count's kind of low. Um, at the end of this dungeon, there's a chest with 20 bombs in it. I usually skip it. Um, but I'll probably get it here just for safety. So flare dancers are kind of weird. Uh, we've been talking about damage and stuff, but these guys, so you would think that the big Goron sword, which is the most powerful sword in the game, would kill them like really quickly, but they actually take less damage from, the, from that than the master sword for whatever reason. Them and Ganon are the only exceptions. So you can get on that platform right before the cutscene starts and ride this up during the cutscene. Saves a little bit of time. Similarly, you can climb this wall during this cutscene. All right, so now for the scariest casual experience from all of our childhoods, the spiral. Have you ever fallen here in a run? Uh, one time. One time. All right. And it's it was a, a run where I was rolling on every segment because it was really bad and I just wanted to save time. <laughs> Sometimes slow is fast. So 
So coming up is something interesting that I think it's the first instance of where we're gonna jump slash the hammer through this block and there's a switch on the other side of it. This is actually completely intended. There are places such as Spirit Trial and Water Temple where there are walls that have just have a bar texture, but it's a, it's a whole wall and you're meant to slash through them so we can just slash through any wall we want. So that's the save warp, the second one of three in this run. Uh, we're gonna get back to the beginning of Fire Temple this way. We used to use four as wind to get back to the beginning of Fire Temple, um, but with save warps being included, it's faster to use the save warp here and use four as wind, um, where you saw us use it to skip climbing up that giant nice. fence wall. So hopefully it doesn't happen, but this next room uh, shows that torch slugs are terrible. Torch slugs and fire keys, the best room in all of Zelda. Yep. Notice me, notice me, please. Oh my god, okay. Wow. Okay. Not the worst. That was actually not too bad. Yeah. Sometimes the enemies just go to every single corner of the room and run away from you. <laughs> yeah, because the problem with torch slugs is that when you put out the fire, they beeline directly opposite you. And so if you happen to put out one of their fires and not actually kill them, then they just scatter and it's really bad. So you notice also that I'm using, instead of the hookshot here, because I don't have it equipped, um, I'm using the earthquake thing when you stab a wall with a hammer to actually knock this guy down. If I get a bomb drop here, I probably won't get this chest. Uh, these guys have a, like a 50% chance to drop a bomb or something. I didn't get it, so I'm going to grab this chest instead. And by a bomb, I mean five bombs, because <laughs> each drop is worth five. Eleven bombs, which I have right now, is actually the bare minimum I'd need to complete the run until the next possible drop. So 20 is very comfortable. Yeah, when I started watching Butch Lesson, trying to run it myself, uh, the one thing I noticed was that bomb count was really tight, which coming from glitched runs is usually, usually the case, but here you wouldn't think so. But. All right, so Lavaji is coming up, and that's a really cool fight. Um, but if you guys who have played this game before know, you sort of generally need that gigantic pillar to fall through the ceiling in this room in order to just get to the boss door to begin with. Uh, there's plenty of glitch ways to get over there. You can use hover boots if you have hover boots early. But uh, it's actually really easy to avoid all of that. <laughs> so we just jump straight up, which is not what you're supposed to do at all. Yeah. Um, and the way that works is that you have to hit forward and at, a, a, at the same exact time. Yeah. Uh, if, if they're offset at all, the jump won't make it. I think you actually have one frame of offset there. Okay. That's allowed. Because you're against a wall. Walls are weird. All right, so this fight, if I fail, it'll be really bad. But uh, generally, it's not that hard. So if you notice, when I entered the room, I think I had 37 seconds. So I have to beat this boss and enter the blue warp within 37 seconds. Yeah, we're going to need some audio cues, so keep it kind of quiet. Okay, nice. All right, so there's a little bit to explain there because that probably looked really weird to a lot of you. Um, so the way this fight works is the one that flies and the one that you play whack-a-mole with are actually two completely distinct entities uh, with two distinct hitboxes. And the one that flies, its hitbox is stored underneath the last hole it flew into. Uh, and in the beginning of the fight, in the cutscene, it always flies into that first hole that you saw me bombing. Uh, also, I'm just going to talk to the talk to Navi about this so the warp can load around me and I won't take lava damage. Um, so yeah, so what I was doing there was bombing that hole uh, in between cycles of playing Whack-A-Mole. Uh, and if you can get seven bombs in within three cycles of Whack-A-Mole, you'll have done enough damage 
to kill it without ever flying. And if it does fly, then you're completely screwed because you don't have enough time to kill it without the Goron tunic. Um, but yeah, it's not a glitch because there's a hitbox there and you can hit it. So just because you're not supposed to know it's there, it doesn't mean you can't hit it. And there are, are some subtleties that happen with that fight as well. Um, for example, when you're doing the first set of bombs, if you bomb too quickly, uh, it can cause a fly cycle. If Danny B hits Volvagia's head after crouch stabbing it um, with a sword or with the bomb, um, that can cause a fly cycle. So depending upon which hole Volvagia comes out of, you have to be very careful with your bomb placement so that you don't accidentally cause damage to the hitbox you don't want to. And also, of course, it's always possible for her to pop up in the same hole that I'm trying to bomb, and that can be a real pain. Uh, and so that can happen, if it happens in the first two cycles, you sort of have to place the bombs, walk around to the middle of the room to stun her face in the middle so that you can go back around and bomb behind her so that the bomb doesn't hit her face, which would cause a fly cycle. So there's a lot to learn in that fight, but uh, once you get it down, it's not that bad. We've actually had a request. Since it's been a while since the run started, we've had a request to reintroduce the couch crew. Sure. Oh. So this is Monkly. I am Jethro TV. I am Torje. And I'm Tatsu. And I'm Danny B. <laughs> <laughs> Get this hard here for safety. Don't need it, but it's good to have. So one more thing about the Volvagia fight is that uh, in glitched runs, a lot, a lot of times you'll see them do a wrong warp out of that room, and that requires some extra time on the timer. Uh, so generally you need five hearts to complete that room in glitched runs. Um, but in glitchless, we can do it in four hearts and even a tiny bit less. Three and seven eighths is possible. So, so until, this... until recently, this wasn't allowed for some reason, but you can just jump over my death. That angle's a little bit precise. Sometimes you'll see runners sit there and spam backflips, and Mido will defeat them, and then they need to adjust. Yeah, you're supposed to play Saria's song, so he moves out of the way, but that's slow. Right, so if you remember the block puzzle that we skipped in Fire Temple, I'm about to do something pretty similar to that here, to skip this maze, which is super annoying. Nice. So what he does there is he gets a precise position and then adjusts his angle and sort of jumps over the water and then curves back in. Yeah, you see, he uses C up there rather than in the fire temple use the hook shot. And there's a weird thing about C up that if you go into C up, it goes into first person mode and you can turn left and right and up and down. But the camera turns at a different speed than Link. So he can, he'll turn a whole bunch or a little bit and then cancel it and Link only moves fractions of an angle. And right before that happened, the, he actually backflipped over a Navi text trigger. Yep. So it's another example of all these little things going on that you might not actually notice. Music's so good. So Forest Temple, which is the one we're about to do, uh, underwent a route change uh, just like three or four months ago. We actually found a 10 seconds faster route through this dungeon, which is really unusual for Glitchless, because usually unless you're changing the rules, things are pretty set in stone as far as what you can do. Um, but we found a way to use Pharaoh's Wind. Nice. <laughs> Ocarina is still hard. <laughs> if Ocarina songs were the final boss, then this game would actually be really hard. <laughs> um, but yeah, we can use Pharaoh's Wind in a certain way uh, to skip, or to get an early key along with a crazy jump slash recoil to get to a place early. I'll call that out when it happens. I wish we could do that with Deku Notes. <laughs> Just disappear. Yeah. Hook shotting is hard too, <laughs> almost as hard as Ocarina. You'd actually be surprised. There's a lot of aiming in this run, and you could literally lose minutes to aiming. <laughs> it's happened. So as this is a Zelda dungeon, we're going to be collecting some more keys. Fun fact about those Wolfos that are below Danny B right now. Um, if you drop a bomb, they're actually afraid of it. So if you're trying to climb the vines and they're <laughs> swiping at you, you can drop a bomb to cover yourself. And I actually don't run away, that. and you can climb them. Yeah. Is that true of all wolfos? Uh, I don't know. 
I have never tried it except for those two. So if you notice I just did a jump slash right there, this cutscene that happens is on a timer after you enter the room. Uh, and so after a certain point, Link will just stop moving. But if I jump slash right before the cutscene starts, the jump slash is able to complete while the cutscene is going, and so I can get just a little bit of extra distance and end up on these stairs instead of before them. So now for Stealthos. Stealthos are really fun. I actually really like fighting Stealthos. I think you're the only one. <laughs> So Stealthos fights are a little bit tough. Oh, that actually went really well so far. Oh, dang. All right. That was Not a good bad. fight. So we want to crouch stab them because we're still doing that stored damage. We're doing four damage per crouch stab. Um, but because they're running around you in circles and because they have shields, uh, it can be difficult to land those hits. Um, so because of that, it's actually really nice if Stealthos are aggressive. If they're jump slashing towards you, they expose themselves and we can land crouch stabs really easily. So even though jump slashing Stealthos might seem scary, it's sort of a nice thing. So generally, uh, before we found the route change through this dungeon, we would have gone and played Song of Time to get rid of that Song of Time block. And uh, gone to the courtyard room to get the key that's at the bottom of the well here. Um, but that's not going to happen. We're actually going to go straight to this block puzzle. And I know we said earlier that block puzzles are annoying and we're going to skip most of them, but this one, unfortunately, needs to be done because there's no way to skip it glitchless. Yeah. And it is, of course, the longest one. <laughs> that would be the way. We probably have some time for donations, actually. We actually have a question oh. in a donation, so I'll let this be that time to work with that. That guy, 183, donated $15 to ask question for the Zelda Ocarina of Time speedrunners. I've noticed there have been some exploits being used. What qualifies this run as a glitchless any percent versus a glitched any percent? Right, so we explained this earlier and it's sort of that this run has such a, or this game has such a spectrum of things that you can and can't do. Um, and it's really impossible to have like a one line set definition of what is or isn't a glitch. Um, and so the runners of this category just sort of got together and drew a line and said everything on this side is a glitch, everything on that side isn't. Um, and if you place everything on the spectrum, there's generally a pretty good line where you know, things of greater magnitude are glitches and things of, that are pretty simple aren't. Um, and there's a, uh, a paste bin on the FAQ page of my channel that, ha that lists all the things that you can and can't do in this run if you're curious. One way of looking at it is to think about the mechanics and try and imagine what mechanics the developers of the game intended you to use. Uh, so you've seen us do damage boosts. Uh, the developers intended for bombs to boost you through the air. What they didn't intend is things like mega side hops where we use our shield and some very precise backflip timing or side hop timing to fly backwards through the air. All right, they didn't want that to happen. Yeah, so generally um, if you create a new mechanic, it's a glitch. If you use a mechanic that's a part of the game normally to do something that's unintended, then it's an exploit. And um, that question specifically asked the difference between like glitchless any percent and regular glitched any percent. Um, if you haven't seen glitched any percent, <laughs> go <laughs> check that yeah. out and <laughs> you will see just how powerful glitches can be and what sort of things have been banned. So jump slash recoil I mentioned earlier, this is the reason why this dungeon is 10 seconds faster, get to there really early. And that allows us to get this key in here way earlier than we're supposed to. Yeah, there's something interesting on that jump slash recoil as well, and we're going to see it again later, that uh, Link's head can kind of get stuck in ceilings. And so he get, gets a little bit of extra distance from that. We call that anti-grav, right. um, and it's the re or anti-gravity, I guess. And it's the reason why B1 skip and take a tree works. Now this magic drop, if it lands on the chest, is going to be really annoying. Okay, good. Yeah, for whatever reason, you can't pick up items that are on top of chests. Unless you jump, up, jump on top of the chest. But. A little something interesting here with this chest. Uh, Danny B is going to put on iron boots, and if he were to just stand in front of this chest, he wouldn't be able to open it. But he's going to hookshot into it and spam A, and that's going to allow him to open the chest. You actually don't even need to spam. Uh, just hookshotting anything underwater. Uh, and if it puts you like on the ground, puts you into the state where you can where you can open treasure chests underwater when you normally can't. And if there's anything in this run that's super questionable as far as glitchless goes, that's it. 
Um, I don't know why it works, and I'm not sure if anyone knows exactly why it works. So because there's sort of that murkiness about what's going on, uh, we allow it for now because it doesn't really skip much, uh, and it's not that important. But yeah, if that was like a major skip, there would probably be a lot more discussion about it. My hypothesis for that is there's some sort of animation thing going on because if you hookshot low enough, he doesn't do his little floaty I'm um, sinking animation. All right, Dakin nuts. Maybe don't know. Dakin nuts are really strong. Oh, whoops. Nice. So aggressive is good, like Jethro said. Uh, when they jump slash you, you can stab them much easier. And he uses Forest Wind right there uh, because getting Forest Wind animation going while the platform dropping animation is also going is just efficient. So I said I like fighting Stealth, so I'm not liking it too much right now. Okay, not awful. It's not as noticeable on the uh, Wii, but on N64, those Stalfos dying creates a absolute ton of lag. Those also, this, yeah, this chest is floating. <laughs> floating. It's really strange, but it's not actually perfectly on the ground. I think that's the only one like that as well. So you notice that green ball of light? That's the marker for having a Ferris Wind warp point set in that room. Uh, so I'll return to that room later via Ferris Wind. So he's about to have to fight this Poe. And the way Poe's work is kind of interesting. Dang. Aww. You can one cycle it there. Right after its invincibility frames wear off and right before it disappears, you have like two frames or so to get in a crouch stab and kill it in one cycle. Um, and also something that's notable about that fight is that Dekunot's uh, make it reappear immediately instead of spinning at you with its torch. So again, Dekunat's being really powerful. Skip some Navi text right there. You can actually skip the text that he got earlier in this twisted hallway, but since we have to walk back through it, it's just not, it's not worth skipping it. And basically you would skip them just by moving around them. They plopped these Navi text triggers in the middle of the hallway where they figure you'll be. Yeah. Um, but they didn't make them wide enough to cover the whole thing. Nice. So if you're just smart about it, you literally walk right past them. Another one of those zero speed rolls going yeah, off the ledge. I had to be a little extra careful with that one because if I had just dropped off the ledge, I might have fallen down that hole in the floor. and That would have been really terrible. So boss key, that's all we need. Uh, before that... Uh, jump slash recoil was discovered that saved 10 seconds. I would have fallen down that hole in the floor and gone and got the floor master key then. Uh, but because we already got it, we get to cash in on that time save by using Ferris Wind much earlier. Alright, second try, Poe. See if we can get the fast cycle here. Yep. There we go. So Don't need that chest. The map or the compass? That's the compass. Compass. So there's a Navi trigger here as well, but if I roll upright, I can just barely avoid it and also make it to here. And you saw that highlight of getting that Navi text like eight times in a row. <laughs> yeah. For some reason, sometimes when you interact with the Navi text trigger, if you move backwards right after you trigger it, you can trigger it a second time. And I didn't know that <laughs> back back in the day. And so I have a highlight on my channel of me just getting hit by it, moving backwards to try to set up the jump again, but getting hit by it again. And then I move forward to try to do the jump, getting hit by it again, moving backwards <laughs> to try to set up the jump again, and I get hit by it again four times in a row, and I just rage quit the run. So this is the second instance of anti-grav. You can just go right into this little hole. <laughs> Weird camera there. 
Now he's gonna try something. He's gonna try to side hop off of this chest. That didn't work. Nope. <laughs> you can side hop off of, onto and off of that chest, and the top of the ceiling doesn't exist, like the Darinia's door and the bridge in Cookery Forest. Yeah, so if I were to have gotten on top of that treasure chest and backflipped, I could have gotten over the boundary of the ceiling and walked through the ceiling to the door while it was down. Um, but I got really weird camera when I hit that switch, and so my general movement setup didn't work. This puzzle is thankfully always the same. The yeah, if you fail it, it resets uh, randomly. But the first time it's always the same. Finishing it with 26 on the clock is generally what I try to do. Um, there's a new strat to fight this Poe that spawns here. And it's a really good strat, so I'm going to try to get it. Oh, dang, it didn't work. Well, that was weird. Okay. Still so not too bad. What was supposed to happen there is uh, that Poe was supposed to wedge itself between the pot and the wall, uh, and it would have been stuck, like, right there. Uh, and if that was true, if that happened, I would have been able to get all three stabs on it right away. So final Poe fight here. Last one, but also the easiest. Yeah, oddly we get this question a lot. How do you know which one's the real one? It's the one that spins. It's a shame she takes way too long to spawn. So I'm running low on Decadence here, I only have two left, and I'm going to be wanting to use more than two in the run. So the next place I can get them is Spirit Temple, so I'm going to make sure I try to remember to get them from a box in Spirit Temple. Got that arrow drop. Sometimes when you shoot that Poe, uh, the four ghosts converge on you instead of like flying backwards with the recoil of the arrow. Uh, and that time it converged on me on this, at the same time as I was going to get the item drop. And so that's really good because when that happens, you get arrows right away. You can read some donations before I get to the boss here. We have so many. I don't know <laughs> how long it would need for me to read them all. We have a $50 donation from Random Guy 44 That Volvagia fight blew my mind. Save the animals, though. <laughs> we have a $1,000 donation. From Captain Reynolds. Third donation had to be the biggest. Legend of Zelda was the first game I ever played when I was five, and I fell in love immediately. I just drained about one-fifth of my bank account to make this donation. And I challenge all others to say, hey, listen, what do you actually need that money for? Donate because those less fortunate need it. You guys are amazing. Please never stop breaking games and helping those in need. All right, so this is Phantom Ganon. This is by far my least favorite boss in this run. Uh, doing Phantom Ganon in Glitchless is super annoying. Uh, this guy, if, once you get past the, paint, the painting phase, when you play tennis, sometimes his magic energy balls just fly off in a completely random direction when you return them with your sword. Uh, and so you just have absolutely no chance to get a volley going. So hopefully he cooperates this time. It's also worth noting that when we do get to phase two, his attacks and his behavior change depending upon how much damage has been done to him. Um, and generally it takes six crouch stabs, correct, so, to kill yep. him. Um, and if Danny B does five crouch stabs but doesn't get the sixth, his Phantom Ganon's behavior will change. Um, he starts doing different attacks and he also becomes like a tennis champion. Yeah. And it, the fight really becomes difficult. So then he's going to be careful to either kill him with six or stop at four. Similar to Meg, we get the question a lot, how do you know which one's the real one? He's shinier, and he also makes sound. See, like that. Yep. <laughs> this 
just Phantom Ganon being Phantom Ganon. Okay, good, good. So the first energy ball missing, I had nothing to do with that. There's really no way to prevent that from happening. Um, what I try to do to mitigate that, though, is stand really close to him, so even if the energy ball goes off in an errant direction, uh, it doesn't have enough distance between it and Phantom Ganon to get far enough off path. Um, but sometimes it just gets so far off path that it misses anyway. And it is actually possible to one cycle that boss glitchless, but it is extremely difficult. Yeah. Japanese runner by the name of Bell, who had the world record before we changed the route with new rules and currently has third place, is really good at that fight. Uh, and he can do the one cycle pretty consistently. But he's the only one that does that. You'll notice that we're not picking up heart containers anymore either. Uh, Danny B has enough health to deal with the only remaining heart dependent things, which would be fire trial at the very end of the run. Yeah, I will pick up one more heart container in Water Temple for safety in Shadow Temple later, because in Shadow Temple I'm going to be losing a lot of intentional health. Uh, and by the time I get to Bongo in a run where I'm not using Marathon safe strats, I'm very often at less than one heart, uh, Bongo being the boss of Shadow Temple. So I'm going to get an extra heart container and also go super safe in Shadow to prevent losing too much health. But that's not for a little while. Yeah. Right now we got Water Temple coming up after this cutscene, and Water Temple is a really, really cool dungeon in Glitchless because uh, if you think Water Temple and you think Glitchless, you're probably groaning in your head thinking back to your childhood, but uh, it's actually extremely broken with Ferris Wind. And precise drums. Yeah. So we're about to talk to little baby Decatry here for a minute or two so we can get some more donations in before I get to water. Certainly, we actually have a donation related to that. Zimzel donated $50 to say, this is my favorite Zelda game. I can't wait to see this glitchless run and all the pain it as it took me months to get past the dreaded water temple. <laughs> Very topical there. I don't know how much we want to accept this donation. is from King Joffrey. <laughs> <laughs> He donated $200 to say, good work killing that wolf from the ice caverns. Kill the animals. <laughs> Gotta love Game of Thrones. <laughs> we have a $513 donation from Corvo. First time seeing this category of OOT, and glad I can experience this during such an awesome event. Good luck to Danny B for the rest of the run. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We have a $50 donation from Cranberry91. I've been wanting to donate, but I, I've been, excuse me, I've been waiting to donate, but I wanted to do it during one of my favorite games. So glad I now know a way to make my time with Rudo much, much shorter. <laughs> Thanks for the fantastic run. A $50 donation from Simply Minty. I was stuck on Goron Mountain when I was young, and it took me four years before I picked the game back up, passed the puzzle, and realized what a masterpiece Ocarina of Time was. Good luck to Danny on the speed run. Since we are donating to help save lives, makes sense to save the animals. A $100 donation from Paul Strobel. Save the animals, kill the cuckoos. A $100 donation from Corgi Dude 429 Hooray for Ocarina of Time, my absolute favorite game. This is my first time getting to watch live, but I love watching old runs. Happy to donate to such a great cause. All right, so the first thing you'll notice about this Water Temple segment is that uh, we're going to be swimming with Iron Boots on, which generally isn't supposed to be a thing. Not right here, but when I get inside. Um, so normally what happens with Iron Boots is you sink straight down like this, and you have no control. You just go in a straight line straight down. Um, but if you hold target when you equip Iron Boots and continue to hold target after equipping them, I'm going to actually let this roll go a little longer before I change equips. Um, you can continue swimming on the way down, so you'll see that here. So I hold target there, unpause and continue to hold target, and then I can swim on the way down and direct my fall. Um, and this makes it a lot nicer to just deal with iron boots. Uh, so if you look at the timer, I have 32 seconds left switch to Kokri boots and the timer disappears. For some reason, when you switch boots underwater, 
uh, Link is able to take a breath. And your timer gets to reset once. It's all the air in the boots. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, I don't have the tunic for this dungeon. I don't have water tunic, or Zora tunic. <laughs> uh, and this swim is actually, I think, the longest swim in the dungeon. And because you get to switch boots there, you only need like one, one quarter hearts to survive this swim. 10 seconds is enough. Your water tempo is fast and furious right off the bat after this cutscene. <laughs> so there are six keys in Water Temple. I will only be getting four of them. And actually, I will only change the water level two times. And I will only, I will never enter the central tower. So that's just a little bit of a preview for what Glitchless is like in this dungeon. So the very first thing I'm going to do here is get an early key. If you notice on the way when I was floating up, there's a, a bombable wall. Uh, and that bombable wall is reachable. So a tiny setup. And then buffers an untargeted side hop so you can retarget that wall and it changes your momentum. And again, we overlap the forest wind cutscene with the bomb going off. That wall will blow up when this ends. <laughs> so small optimizations just to be efficient, save seconds everywhere. Yep. So that key is super early now. I wasn't supposed to have that. And that Ferrars one goes back to the very beginning of the dungeon. Okay, those clams can be pretty trolly. All right, so now I have two keys pretty early. So now what I want to do is I want to raise the water level back to the top. I'm not supposed to be able to do that, but that doesn't matter. With this really long setup here, I can actually get back to the top level. And then, once I'm here, I can do this. Nice. So now, I have two keys, the water level is back to the top, and that's all I need to get to the long shot. So we're already halfway done. Yeah, you may be going, wait, he just glitched out on the edge right there. You can actually just grab that ledge if you go far enough to the left, but it's kind of precise. So instead we just jump slash off of the little slope. And all we did was jump and then jump slash. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And nothing, no unintended mechanics there, so not a glitch at all. And then with the hookshot thing, you can barely reach that hookshot point, which is what the long setup was for. Dang. Right. You can get the fast cycle in this room if you are really fast, but it's hard. So I'm going to set Ferris Wind here, uh, be able to get back to the main room via this room uh, from pretty deep into the dungeon later. So I've had to manage my magic pretty well because there's a lot of fairies win in this dungeon and I don't have enough for another. So if I hadn't been managing my magic properly, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Right here. Skip a little cycle here. Yeah. You can just jump slash around. It's coming up as Dark Link the bane of many casual runners, casual players. Uh, and the way Dark Link works is he has the same amount of health as you do, kind of. His health is based on your maximum hearts, so he takes the same number of Master Sword slashes as you have hearts, which is six right now. And this is how we fight him. So for anybody who's totally unfamiliar with Dark Link that might be watching, <laughs> what happens is that he sort of mirrors your movements and it can make him quite challenging to hit. Um, but <laughs> obviously not for Danny B. Yeah, we, we can, can get him, him with the sort of backslash on the Master Sword there. Yeah, Dark Link thinks he's being slick by coming up behind you every time he gets hit, but uh, that actually works in our favor.
So I think there's another Navi text down here. Yeah, right at the edge of this water, uh, there's a Navi text trigger. But I can avoid it by jumping off at the corner instead of at the very edge anywhere else. Navi would have talked to me right before I jumped in otherwise. Oh, that's oh, actually that's... kind of bad. I haven't seen that for a long time. Ah! Don't, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. All right, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been really bad. That was what was supposed to happen the first time. You can actually just long shot that chest, but it's faster to jump slash. It's faster when you don't fail it. Exactly. All right, so now for the snipe. Nice. Nice. First try. And uh, what he just did there was jumped into the water, and the height you jump from determines how deep you go in the water. And so you can just swim under that gate, and we'll see that one more time, hopefully. So now we got two keys, and we're back to the main room, and the water level's high. Uh, and in fact, we only need two keys to get the boss key, and getting to Morpha is possible when the water is high. So we're almost done. A little more iron boots swimming here. So by mashing B, you can swim faster. Uh, supposedly, there is an optimal rhythm to mash B to swim, uh, but I don't know like what it is and if it's possible <laughs> to actually do it right. I'm not even sure that's necessarily true. It's one of those things that people yeah. talk about, but nobody does or really has straight answers to, so everybody just mashes. Right. So this is a thing that you can do to skip a whole big section back there. And I can skip equipping Iron Boots one time by using my fall momentum to get underneath that little lip. So now we're at the boss key, and we're ready to go to Morpha. And the way that jump worked is it's kind of similar to the one in Fire, where you kind of just get boosted off the corner. This next room, there's a really uh, interesting strat that saves not much time. It actually saves like three seconds over the other strat. Oh, really? Yeah, because okay. back walking up this is really fast compared to running forward anyway. Nice. Okay. That's harder than it looks, actually. Now Morpha. So Morpha's starting position after this cutscene is... Uh, Random as one of four positions, I'm pretty sure. She can start in uh, north, south, east, or west around the starting platform that you're on. Um, so if she's far away, it'll be a little bit harder for me to snipe her out of the water. But hopefully, we get uh, good luck here. I never timed the spawn animations. Is this the longest one? Or is it Bongo? Not sure. Have to do that. Dust has been timing a whole <laughs> bunch of cutscenes. <laughs> just, just because nobody's out. done it before, so we don't have the information. Right, so we actually got pretty good luck here in terms of spawn location. Yeah. Hook shotting her can be hard anyway, though. It works. Nice. Good. Nice, good fight. So normally you're supposed to do that fight uh, in cycles, and she'll like start spawning multiple tentacles, and it gets really hectic, but you can just trap her in the corner. PSA, if you mash buttons, you can actually escape the tentacles grab. Something that some people don't know. So we're going to pick up this hard container, just for safety. And it's fast. It's right there. 
And now for the longest cutscene in the game. Yeah, so donations. <laughs> Certainly. We have a $500 donation from Fish Sticks. So hype for the glitchless Ocarina of Time that I had to donate now. The GDQs amaze and inspire me every event. Keep up the good work and die, animals, die. We have a $50 donation from Sock Folder. SGDQ has been so fun to watch this year. Great job to all the runners. I'm excited to see Glitchless Ocarina of Time. It has been so long since I've seen a dungeon other than the Deku Tree and Ganon Tower. <laughs> <laughs> we have a $50 donation from Neaxis. Always love to donate during Zelda. Have a good run and listen to Navi. I don't think we've been doing that. <laughs> A uh, $100 donation from Prasanna Swaminathan. Love me a GDQ, and I love me some Ocarina of Time. Save the frames, kill the animals. A $350 donation from English Dude. Haven't missed a GDQ since 2012, and have made a tradition of budgeting $500 per, and have been at work patiently waiting for Ocarina of Time and Final Fantasy VI all week. First donation for this run. Can't resist watching it every time and play it annually. Thank you all for the amazing work done every six months, and keep at it. A $50 donation from Jay Oster. I fondly remember that cold day in November 1998 when Ocarina of Time was released. I don't think I've anticipated any game as much in the days leading up to it. My brother and I stayed home sick from school just to play the game for the first time. Worth it. Such good memories from this game. And as always, good feels from GDQ. Thank you, everyone. $50 donation from Thomcat. Owl Skip was awesome. Here's more money for Doctors Without Borders. $100 anonymous donation. When I was a kid, I would try to physically look around the corners in the Forest Temple maze, looking forward to being so engrossed in the temple again. $30 anonymous donation. First time donating, but I feel compelled to donate for Legend of Zelda. Ocarina of Time was the first game I saw a speedrun of, and right now it's brightening up a very cloudy afternoon here in Sydney. $50 donation from Kelsey. Thanks for another great summer of runs for charity. Go Danny B! And a $50 donation from Danny B's parents. Aww. We're enjoying watching. Aww. Hi, Danny B's parents. <laughs> Hi, Danny B's Hello. parents. <laughs> Hi, Danny B's parents. Love you guys. All right, so fire arrows are something we don't care about at all. Nope. Typically, you would go stand on that little pedestal and shoot the sun and get fire arrows. Um, that post-water cutscene is supposed to set that up for you. Twitch chat is also saying hi to Danny B's parents, <laughs> <laughs> Now, right now we're headed to Gerudo Valley to obtain the Gerudo card because there's a gate blocking the wasteland to Spirit Temple that we can't get around without it. Hookshotting this ladder is actually a pain. Dang. Yep. So what's supposed to happen there is if I hookshot the top left corner of that ladder, I'll grab the ledge of the stone instead of climbing the ladder and just make my way but uh, sometimes he falls. I think I hookshot a little bit too far to the right there. Yeah, ladders in this game aren't the most stable things in the world. But uh, so these, the Gerudo card involves saving four carpenters from the fortress, and you have to fight four of the guards of the fortress in order to free each of those carpenters. Um, and so the guard fights are going to look a little bit weird, and I'll explain more about it when we get there. So one thing to note, I guess, right now is that uh, Epona is also something we don't care about. And generally, Epona is the way to cross this bridge that I think most casual players used. But you can also just straight up long shot the wooden stuff across. But we don't get to see the cool jumping cutscene. <laughs> And actually, it's possible to just hookshot across yep. um, if you stand in a really precise location with really precise aim. Nice post. Uh, but uh, long shot makes it super easy. So my movement here was actually a little bit bad. Um, so if we enter the fortress area and it's dusk, like everything's orange, then I know I was actually pretty slow. Uh, 
Yeah, like that. Um, so because it's dusk and because I was slow, the, navigating the wasteland is actually going to be quite a bit more difficult visually. Um, but hopefully it should be fine. Ideally, it would still be full daytime here, but uh, having to climb that ladder kind of ruined it. And daytime doesn't pass once we're in the fortress area, so whatever it's set to when Danny B enters is what we would have to deal with. Okay, so first guard fight. Jump slash into each of these text triggers just to get a little bit extra distance. Store the jump slash uh, for my crouch stabs. So what I'm gonna do here is get into the corner behind this torch. And when you hook shot near one of these guys or girls, they jump at you. And that makes the fight pretty easy. You can just lure them in the corner and then you're stuck. Or they're stuck, so they can't leave. A lot of people get upset about that because the Grudo Guard is sort of clipping into the post and it looks like a glitch. But I like to think that their runs are now invalidated <laughs> and not ours. <laughs> Yeah, and he's actually facing away from the Grudo Guard, but the Crouch Stab does damage every frame, even when he's holding it back. Like, the whole sword does damage, even including the hilt. So one thing, of course, I have to be careful of is not to get caught. If I get caught, I get thrown in jail, and that's really slow. Uh, and in each of these guard fights, uh, there's a chance at some point that one of them will do this crazy spin attack, and if you get hit by it, uh, you don't lose health, but you just immediately get thrown into jail. So hopefully I don't get bad luck here. Okay. There we go. So the reason it didn't jump the first time is because she was in the middle of swinging her sword, and so I wasn't able to interrupt that. I've only ever been spin attacked and sent to jail one time, and it was actually really recently. The very moment that she dropped down from the ceiling on the final guard fight, she immediately did the spin attack and sent me to jail, and there was really nothing I could have done about it. And I'm still not sure if it was just really bad luck or something that I did to manipulate that to happen, but it generally doesn't. I feel like this is one of those places that when you played the first time, you kind of wandered around wondering where to go. Yeah. And then we just know exactly where to go. So I swear, like a year into speedrunning, I still didn't even know. <laughs> so few uh, runs go to this and do this objective. So if you notice, some of my crotch stabs are missing. Uh, there's just a particular rhythm that I need to stab at. And if I miss it, then she can dodge the attack. But there's really no way for her to escape, so it's pretty safe. Like, it's slow if I miss it, but it won't mess up anything. All right, so now we're going to break the geometry of the fortress just a little bit. You can make that jump there. Whoops. And you can make this jump here. That makes getting over to the final one quite a bit easier. So now this lady can catch me, but what I'm going to do is make my way to this back wall. Sniper before she can. And that's marginally faster than waiting for her to cross the path of the box and shooting her from behind the box. You can also use the long shot, but it's just not equipped right now. Or I guess it is, but it's slower. All right, nice. That was a good fight. So I have a project for everyone at home. I want you to go and get this Gerudo card. And when this lady gives you the Gerudo card, pull out a bomb because this lady's tunic is hilarious. So if you notice, her tunic is green, and it matches mine. If I was wearing a different tunic, it would also match mine. So if I was wearing blue, she'd be wearing blue. Uh, but when you pull out a bomb, her tunic flashes along with the bomb, and it's really bizarre. Also bomb shoes. Bomb shoes as well, yep. So Gerudo card in hand, we are going to head off to the wasteland. Well, first we have to get them to open the gate. Yeah, true. 
So there's a little trick with this gate. If I talk to the gate guard up at the top, at the top with my camera angle facing away from the gate, uh, it actually takes a few frames for the gate to load before it opens. And so I can use those few frames to get onto this ladder during the cutscene. So the gate's not on screen, so it'll take a few frames, and I can get on the ladder. And I'll drop off the ladder, and if I didn't drop off the ladder there, and I was still on the ladder by the time the cutscene was over, the game actually softlocks and accepts nowhere inputs. So it's really important that I press A to drop. So you're supposed to have, or technically, you can have the Lens of Truth to get through the wasteland, and it makes it a lot easier because it removes this kind of dust storm that's happening but the path is the same every time, so we can just go through it. Yeah, it's quite easy in this first segment, because even if you don't know where you're going, you can follow the posts. Um, but just to refresh your memories, the second segment has no posts, and you're supposed to follow a po using the Lens of Truth. Um, typically, you use textures on the ground or just muscle memory to move through it, since we can't see the po. Go. Cool. All right, so this is the part where you don't get the Po. Uh, so Lens of Truth is in the bottom of the well. It's uh, the only dungeon or mini dungeon that we don't touch at all in this run. Well, trials. Or, um, Grudo Training Grounds. Oh, Training Grounds, I guess that's true as well. Because those have Ice Arrows and Ice Arrows. Yeah. Ice Arrows are very useless. <laughs> So Danny B moved through that pretty easily, but he was actually quite close to some void zones. Um, if he had strayed left or right, uh, even a small amount, he would have voided and gone back to the start of the wasteland, which is really costly. Yeah. All right, so the reason we came over here is not to do Spirit Temple. We actually only want the song at this point, um, because in order to do the adult side of Spirit Temple, we need the Silver Gauntlets, which are acquired from the child side, child side of Spirit Temple. Excuse the voice crack. Um, so we're going to get Requiem, which is the song here, and then we're going to go back and start uh, the second child section of the run. Come here, get Silver Gauntlets, and then return as adult to complete the dungeon as adult. So we can get some donations in this cutscene here. Certainly. We have a $10 donation from Worm Talon, who which says, oh, so that's how you're supposed to do the water temple. <laughs> yeah. And people are very, very happy with how you dealt with that because we have another one, $25 from Mercs. Had to donate again for this amazing Ocarina of Time run, especially the Dark Link fight and making those water temple look like the easiest parts of the game. Keep up the good work and mercilessly, mercilessly slaughter those animals to save the peer in innocent frames. We have a $25 donation from Vinnie Vine Sauce. I love the glitches, but it's great to see a long glitchless run of Ocarina of Time, one of the best games ever. Thanks for the amazing week of entertainment. A $200 donation from an anonymous donor. Thanks for everything you guys are doing. OOT hype. 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 Awesome. We have a $50 donation from Rax. Hey guys, long time watcher, second time donating. I remember the day Ocarina of Time came out and watching the, these talented fans speed through the game again really brings me back. The GDQs are amazing events for amazing causes, so here's my part. Since the runners have revealed that no cuckoos will be harmed during the making of this speed run, put this towards killing the animals. P.S. Mweet. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the third and final save warp in this run. We're going to use it to get back to Temple of Time so that we can learn Prelude really fast. There's something interesting about the end of Requiem uh, as well, that that sandstorm, you actually can't pause during it, but you can pull out your ocarina. So in the old route, we used to equip and then pull ocarina to play the song faster, but because we're save warping. So you notice right before the cutscene trigger there, I pulled out my sword um, and... So I did that so that the couple frames where Link is actually reaching for his sword and not actually swinging coincide with the beginning of the cutscene. And that's because when I place the Master Sword on the pedestal here, uh, if sword is already in hand, which it will be after the cutscene, uh, it takes a couple less frames to actually drop it.
So that is the second to last song we'll learn. The only one remaining is Nocturne, which is the one that gets you to Shadow Temple. And of course, Shadow Temple early is a staple of most Glitch Thrones, but uh, walking along the side, the, the boundary of the graveyard is not allowed in this run. Though it is possible to get up there without using glitches. Yeah, you can actually damage boost on top of it, but part of Glitchless is no out of bounds, and that's considered out of bounds. Before we head off to Child Spirit to get the Silver Gauntlets, we need a Dense Fire. All right, yeah, and Dense Fire will serve all our Pyromaniac needs in, in, replace of, er, in place of Fire Arrows. So if you guys remember this owl that was here with Malum, uh, then I said it was really hard to skip it. If I had skipped it earlier, it would still be here, so I'd have to skip it again, which is another reason why it's completely ridiculous to try to do it in a run. Tunnels are also really hard. <laughs> right up there with the ocarina and aiming. <laughs> so Child Spirit Temple is probably one of the more technical sections of the run, um, especially in the lower floors. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, every single one of these fairies has their own unique like camera pan around their bodies. It's really weird. <laughs> they put a lot of time and effort into this. <laughs> yeah, the beginning of Child Spirit is pretty tough. Uh, there's also a lot of potential to lose health, so I'll have to be careful here. But I do have an extra heart container that I'm used to, so it should be fine. I also have a lot more bombs than I'm used to here because we picked up that 20 bomb chest in Fire Temple. Normally at this point I'd have like three bombs instead of 11. Levers are the worst. Unfortunately we have to talk to Nibiru. Yeah, so Nibiru talks for a little while, so if you guys have some donations in the next minute, you can squeeze them in. I think this is the longest text interaction in the game, right? Is that true? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, and the text options there are important. The, the first text option, you need to choose the third. Uh, and then the second time you have an option, neither, uh, both of them will get you to the end of the conversation, but the second option is three seconds faster. And then there's a third time where you can choose an option, but that one, the first one is correct, so you just mash right through it. And it's easy to remember the options because it's three, two, one. Yeah, I think this is the longest text in the game other than like the infinite talking to owls because you don't know which one is yes and which one's no. All right, here we go. So I got a big equip here. I need uh, bombs, Din's fire, Hylian shield because it's fire keys and boomerang. I've been told to interrupt you guys sure. for a okay. couple of reasons. First of all, we just hit three quarters of a million dollars. I think nice. that's pretty amazing. Right? Right? I think that definitely means we can hit that one million dollars by the end of the marathon. And what pushed us over is the other reason why I'm allowed to interrupt you, is that there is a $10,000 donation. Wow. Wow. Woo! 
from someone named LV. I love that SGDQ exists. Doctors Without Borders is a great charity, and I'm happy to support them in this event. Whether it's by giving here or doing something elsewhere in life, I hope everyone can find their own inspiration to do what they can and make the world a better place. Thank you so extremely very much, LV. That was a great contribution. Yeah, so there's a few things. Firstly, this piece can hit you in this cutscene, and it does no damage. Like this. Nice. But in that first room with all the enemies, he used bombs and manipulation to kill them all really quickly. And then in the second room, you can bend the way the hookshot moves by moving after you've thrown it. The boomerang. Oh, boomerang. Sorry. Uh, so he throws it and then moves left to have it bend around the post. Shoutouts to Makai. And then... The last one was right after you hit that switch, you can backflip into the void and it skips the uh, cutscene of the, or it skips the cutscene of the fire starting and the Anubis flies into the fire. So it does two things at once. Oh, what? That was... All right. Last time we dealt with these guys was in Decatree and didn't quite go so well. So we skipped a lot of items in this run, Dang. and one of them so far has been bomb shoes. But bomb shoes are actually really powerful, and we're going to get some right now. So these ten bomb shoes will be the only ones I get in the run. Too. This run has actually been like very low on bonks. Yeah. Nice bomb drop. So if you notice, sometimes those gray spiky things on the ground, sometimes I'll roll right through them and not take damage. And uh, that's something I think we haven't mentioned yet, is when Link is rolling, for a few frames during his roll, he's actually completely invincible to damage. Um, and so in the case of those spike, th spike things, it manifests itself as just passing right through them. Pretty sure this is the last time we have to pull blocks as well. Yep. Well, I guess we could push one in water trial, but that doesn't count because it's pushing. <laughs> so just rolled right through that guy. So if you notice, I completely skipped the silver rupees in this room. They're not useful. So we're about to fight an iron knuckle. Uh, this is another instance where being able to store the Deku stick damage and do crouch stabs is great. Um, these plates are also interesting because there are sort of safe spots. Um, if you get really close, <laughs> they'll just swing right over you. It's a little more precise as a dole, but Child Link is really small. So if you notice, I picked up a couple hearts before that fight. Uh, I don't usually do that because that fight's pretty easy and it's really easy to avoid getting hit. But on the off chance that I did get hit, I would have done four hearts worth of damage and I only had three. So just in the interest of not dying and losing a lot of time. Picked up a couple safety hearts there, so I was able to survive one hit. And unfortunately, this owl is completely unskippable. He catches you right as you walk out, and his uh, trigger overlaps the load. He just flew into the temple, by the way. I don't know how that happened. He usually doesn't take that direction. Magic. Uh, and something interesting that I actually found out yesterday, because uh, we were messing with this owl and seeing if there was any way to skip him. Uh, if you use cheats to open this chest before you talk to the owl, uh, he talks to you right here as it's fading away. Uh, and then you have owl music through the entirety of this <laughs> cutscene, which is really out of place because Nibiru is getting kidnapped and it's just singing a little dinky owl song. And similarly to Requiem, while that uh, dust is on screen, you can actually move, kind of. You can like side hop and stuff. And you can actually side hop back into the temple, but it'll completely lock your game. So Nibiru has been captured. 
by the evil witches. All right, and child two is done. Now we're going to adult two, and that'll be the final section of the run. So all we have left are adult spirit, shadow, and then Ganon's castle. As we said earlier, there's one song we don't have yet. It's Nocturne, so we're gonna go get that first. Yep. Interesting note about Nocturne is that uh, it's <laughs> it has the longest sequence of cutscene without any input that I have to do. Um, so there's no text mashing for like a minute and two seconds or a minute and one second. Something like that. And so in runs at home. Generally, three and a half hour runs involve a bathroom break. And so this is when I would do that. I think Nocturne and Requiem are fairly unique in that there are cutscenes that start as you enter a load to an area, so they're unskippable, so far as we know. Which is unfortunate. So we can get some donations in before I get to Spirit Temple. Sure thing. We have a $1,337 donation. So a total elite donation, right? Donations from Kizo. Really enjoying SGDQ so far. Big thanks to everyone involved for making SGDQ 2016 such a great event for helping a great cause. Money goes to Runner's Choice. Much love, Kizo. And a $99 donation from KC. Without the adult wallet, this is all the money I can hold. I'll go <laughs> cut some more grass. And we have some donations without comments, but they are both $500, so I do want to acknowledge both of them. We have an anonymous $500 donation, and we have another one from Drizlock. So thank you, both of you. Even without comments, that's really great. We have a $10 donation from Kurt Plop. One more donation. Always glad to see my favorite 3D Zelda at these presentations. We have a $50 donation from Raja. Thank you for showcasing my favorite game, Ocarina of Time, and let's help Doctors Without Borders. Oh, and kill the animals. We have a donation from, I'm gonna butcher this, Escielis. We've doomed Ultimate Doomed. We've saved Tamriel five times over. The only thing left to do is glitch Hyrule into nothingness and suplex that train. We have a $25 donation from Drevin7116. Long time watcher, one of my favorite weeks of the year. Hype for the glitchless ocarina. Oh yeah, and kill the animals. This is the hardest song in the game, definitely. I'll probably <laughs> fail it. All right, nice. A $100 donation from Dardison. Looking forward to your run, Danny B. Everyone, Danny B is a fantastic runner and definitely worth following, so please check him out. <laughs> I'll also be letting this money go to runner's choice. $50 donation from Axron. First time watching GDQ Live and super excited that I get to see Ocarina of Time. All right, and with that, we have learned all the songs we need to finish this run. And we are off to Spirit Temple. Um, we could, at this point, go to Shadow Temple instead. There's nothing stopping us, but my equip right now is better suited to doing Spirit. Uh, so just in the interest of not shuffling equips around, it's a little bit faster to do Spirit first. 
I think it amounts to like six seconds, something like that. So this white text that appears on screen telling me where I am, you can get rid of it by pressing Ocarina, which I just did in midair. And I did that because while the white text is on screen, you actually can't pick up item drops, like that magic, bo magic bar uh, or magic pot. And so if I hadn't cleared that white text, I would have had to wait for it to go away on its own before I could pick up that magic pot. So a little optimization there to be able to fill up magic faster. You might have noticed Danny B jumped up to a really high ledge right there too after getting that magic. Um, I don't know why that ledge is different. It's, I think it's the snake statue. It's like curved, kind of like a armos. Yeah, it's just a, a sort of weird spot. Yeah, it just pushes you, kind of. Uh, okay. Getting the fast boulder cycle in this room is not hard, except for that first one, snaking around it. So at the end of this dungeon, we're going to get our first real introduction to RNG in this run, and that's going to be Twin Rova. The boss of this dungeon is uh, very luck-based in the first phase, anyway, what, before they combine. In my PB, I've got a 20-second time save here, which is actually really significant. And it was mostly because of bad RNG on the boss. These statues work much like graves, where if you get hit, they'll keep spinning. Yeah, there is an invisible enemy here. That you can... Yep, there it is. Yep. <laughs> and if you heard it, he made a little grunt there. I was able to side hop in that cutscene to get a little bit of extra distance. And it doesn't always work. And I'm not actually sure what makes it work. I didn't even know that was a thing. Like sometimes the enemy takes longer to hit me, and so by the time I get up from the damage animation, it's already over, or like I'm already in the cutscene. Uh, this long shot is really annoying. Okay, there we go. Yeah, the long shot is super useful. I wish it wasn't so hard to get. Spirit Temple in particular, it often feels like there's a lot of good long shot spots. Yeah. Um, a few rooms from now, some of you might remember the sliding wall room. Uh, long shot is very helpful. We'll see soon. So normally in this room I'm supposed to hit a switch, but if you stand in this really particular spot, you can get all three of these guys with a Dinspire cast. Second Iron Knuckle of the run. So it's a bit faster strat that I'm about to do here, but the safest strat is to attack him from behind the chair. Because then it takes some time to turn around and you can get some stabs in. So as adult with Iron Knuckles, if you stand directly by an Iron Knuckles left foot, it's a completely safe zone and you won't be able to get hit by the axe. So you see a lot of that when I fight Nibiru later. So most glitched runs at this point uh, end up farming these Armos for bomb drops because uh, there's a pretty solid chance of getting bombs from Armos when you kill them. Uh, but seven is enough to finish this run without needing more. In fact, at this point, I think I only need four or three. Coming up is that, that slidey wall room that Jethro was talking about. Uh, and long shot makes it pretty trivial. 
Good puzzle, Nintendo. <laughs> that one's weird because you're totally supposed to have long shot at that point anyway. So to get the boss key, there's this huge puzzle that involves the hammer and hitting switches and we've done enough puzzles, I mean honestly. So we'll just grab that key. <laughs> so that's pretty similar to the firewall in Fire Temple when I just backflipped right through it. I got damaged by the torch slug uh, and when you get damaged for a few frames after you're invincible and can't take more damage so I can use that time to squeeze myself into the fire ring and just open the chest. I know some of you are thinking that looked really glitchy, but invincibility frames are supposed to be a thing. They are intended to exist, so we make use of them. And right there was what I was talking about a long time ago about attacking stuff through walls. Here. Something I found out recently is if you push the very ends of these, you can actually mash target and let go on your own. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that was a thing. That's amazing. Yeah. So normally what you want is these Lizalfos to slash you off, um, but I, if I position myself properly, I don't need their help, which is actually really good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> because uh, losing health here is generally really bad because I don't have any place to fill up on health before Shadow Temple, where health is really critical. A lot of people crouch and aim the mirror shield at the face there, but if you just see target you're at the perfect height. Nice aim. <laughs> so here's the Naburu Knuckle. We'll see more uh, of the safe zone. Yeah, this is the one where it's really important because with most Iron Knuckles, you can get enough damage in that their armor breaks off and they sort of get stunned. Uh, since Naburu takes more hits, um, and the armor doesn't break off, she doesn't get stunned. It's really important that Danny B positions himself well. Although this is glitchless and he does have a lot of health, um, he still wants to be careful. Especially because Shadow Temple's coming up next and taking a chunk of four hearts out would be really bad. It would probably warrant getting the heart container just so I can fill up after Twin Rova. Mm -hmm. yeah. Easy fight, nice and clean. So if you notice, I didn't stab at a, at a set rhythm there. I actually paused a couple times. That's because between her attacks, when the axe is at rest, uh, I can actually crouch stab recoil off it, and it'll send me backwards, and then I'll be in axe range, which is really bad and dangerous. So I wait for her to attack for me to stab her. Alright, now for Twinarova. Like I said, this boss is quite a troll. Yeah, so what we're going to see in Phase 1, um, Twinarova is two different entities, a fire and an ice witch. And they're going to sort of fly around in random paths. Um, and we want to keep both of them on the screen so that when one of them shoots, we can redirect the shot into the other. Um, because they're both flying around randomly, keeping them both in our view can be tough. Uh, sometimes one will be shooting at you and the second will be right behind your head and you can't really do anything about it. Uh, but we do try to combat that by using the long shot. If you long shot in the direction of one of the witches, she'll spin in a circle to sort of dodge the long shot. Um, so while one is charging up a shot, we can hook shot towards the second and keep them in position, keep them in view so that we can land our attacks. And also when they throw their attacks is random. And so it'll take four hits uh, to get to phase two when they combine. And so it can be either four hits in a row really fast or sometimes they can move a lot between shots and waste a lot of my time. Right, if you watch Danny B's stream, you might hear him talk about like doubles or triples. And that's when Twin Rova shoots two or three times without moving at all. That's sort of the dream. <laughs> that's really fast. Uh, we'll see if we get any here. Nice. <laughs> so this positioning's good. <laughs> One. Oh, we got a oh. double. Nice. Very nice. This 
You notice Ice didn't move at all before shooting again. Triple? No, 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 no such luck. But that's fine. Double is actually really good. Uh, this one might be tough. Okay, good. You can catch that beam from weird angles. Uh, please turn in. Okay. Yeah, so like in that situation, nice. if Ice had flown to the right, uh, Danny B might have been in trouble. Yeah, there's like nothing I could do about that if she went to the right. Sexy Thermo Hexy <laughs> is what this boss is called in German. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so phase two is very easy. I say right before I fail it, probably. <laughs> so we are going to see some more hookshot trickery. Danny B5 is the hookshot right before pulling up the shield, and that causes the twin rover to move on more quickly and get to the next shot more quickly. Thankfully, this boss is really easy to one cycle. With some very easy timing. You can just keep stabs and keep her stunned. Yeah, t uh, Twin Rove is interesting because on that final phase there, uh, most bosses, or at least some of them, are instead of uh, like a timer like she's on to, before she gets up and starts a second, another phase, uh, most bosses are on like a, a damage counter where after you've dealt, dealt a certain amount of damage, it'll get up and start a new phase. Uh, it just so happens that she's on a timer, and that timer is just enough time with power crouch stabs to kill her in one cycle. Additionally, the first cycle of phase two, that she always fires the same th the same element three times in a row, so you can block all three, charge your shield three times, and return fire. Um, if the fight progresses to additional cycles, uh, she starts to randomize. So if you fail the one cycle, things can get really bad really fast. I'm not really sure why I'm mashing in that cutscene. <laughs> <laughs> Habit. Habit. I mean, what else are you going to do? All right, so coming up next is Shadow Temple, which is by far the most difficult part of the run. Um, and I don't know if we've mentioned it yet, but I will not be getting hover boots, which is something that might surprise a lot of people as far as glitchless goes. Uh, but right now we've got a cutscene, so we can take some more donations before then. We have a $50 donation from a name that I'm going to butcher terribly. <laughs> Hydraulio. I don't even know. The talent on display is awesome. Thank you to all the runners and people behind the scenes for a great marathon. A round of applause is in order, yes? You're giving me the applause right for the hardest part, right? All right, we have a $150 donation from Haxton Temeraire. Donating now since I'll miss the Pokemon run. At least I can watch the Zelda one live. We have a $20 donation from Frelfin. Loving the Ocarina of Time glitchless run. I may have to fire up a copy of the game and try out some of the tricks I'm seeing. Donation goes to Runner's Choice. $50 donation from Matthew L. Doing my little bit for the Pokemon Blue Run. Mario Maker, Pepsi Man, and Ocarina of Time has been an amazing nighttime lineup. Sleep is for the week. All right, so right at the start of Shadow Temple, we have another large element of luck, or RNG, and that's the Truth Spinner. Uh, there's this bird statue that you have to spin to face the correct one of five skulls. Uh, in fact, only three of them are ever possibly correct, so I have a one in three chance of getting it right. Um, if you have the Lens of Truth, you can see which one is the correct one, but of course I don't, so I'm going to have to guess. Uh, and then right after Truth Spinner, we're going to be doing a pretty crazy trick to cross that first gap without using the Hover Boots. Uh, and we'll explain what that is. For the most part, I'm not going to be talking too much in Shadow Temple because I need to concentrate, so my couch will take over. Yeah, so earlier he mentioned uh, if you mash Z with, on those statues, they'll keep spinning. If you do that on a true sprinter, it'll break for some reason. Typically, you would equip hover boots here uh, because if he does get the incorrect torch, 
um, the floor is gonna fall out. Uh, but because we don't have hover boots, Danny B is just gonna be careful and side hop out precisely. Nice. First try. Wow, nice. nice. All right, here we go. So this is a double damage boost. The bomb is going to push him into the air. He's going to shield drop a nice. bomb chew. Perfect. And make that gap. Very nice. That is not easy to do. Nope. Yeah, you have to drop the bomb in midair with a single frame of R. Otherwise, you can't shield uh, jump slash afterward. And we need these rupees to collect a key for later. So you notice that double damage boost took away a heart. That's not the that's not the only double damage boost I'll be doing, and there are plenty of other chances to lose health in this dungeon. So the extra heart container will definitely come in handy here. Coming up next, he's going to navigate through a hallway that has a whole bunch of Skulltulas. Um, so we're going to see him do some, not super precise, but some very intentional movement. He's going to side up six times left here, I think, and then throw a Deku Nut. And that stuns these Skulltulas, so he doesn't have to worry about them. He can just continue through the hallway. And there are some more here that he will roll right under. So casually, that hallway is really annoying because your fighting school tool is like every 10 feet. But not a problem for Danny B. And then continuing with the nice movement, as he passes under the skiatine, he's going to hold right. He's going to turn right, roll, and hold upright. And he lands on that tiny little piece of earth. He also avoided spawning a stealth host there. We're going to go get one more key from this back room. More silver rupees. And then, similar to Darunia's door and bridge clip, the bottom of these spike uh, traps don't exist. So you can just backflip through them. Now, normally we'd be doing some movement to manipulate the cycles of these invisible blocks, but it's kind of risky, so marathon strats. Yeah, so what I'm going to be doing to find the location of these blocks is use the hook shot, the, the red dot, to see where it is. So it just moved away, and it just moved in, so now I can make it. If I were, normally what I do is I just YOLO that pretty much, and I move in such a way so that I know exactly where the block cycle is. Uh, if I were to void out there, I would spawn back at the top of that skull to the hallway, which is about a minute loss, so it's not very marathon safe. It's very risky. Nice. Wow. That was weird. There are invisible spikes and invisible platforms and invisible hookshot targets. Uh, Danny B just knows where it all is. Yep. So we're going to put Ferro's wind down because in the next room we have to kill all the enemies to open the door, but that's slow. Save the animals. And to get the key from this room, you're supposed to throw a bomb into that uh, skull, but you can use a chew. Okay, let's see if I can do this. So right here, in this next room is really interesting. There's a bunch of fans blowing you around, and you're supposed to use iron boots. But if you turn the camera away to manipulate the loading of the fans and do some precise movement, Oh, I probably failed it now. Yeah. Aiming. Aiming's too oh, hard. Aiming's too hard. <laughs> so what he has to do there is move in a very precise way, aim and hit that post very quickly, and then he can get off of this raised platform before the fan starts you know, blowing air at him. And then he'd side hop over to here without the iron boots and get blown into this hallway. A really small time lost after you use the iron boots there. Oh, dang. Okay. Invisible chest. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> so I don't usually get that heart, but again, safety. 
You're supposed to go over and push this block up to this ladder, but you can just jump to the boat. So there's some Stalfos on this boat. Uh, I don't want to fight them because Stalfos are risky in terms of health. So I'm going to do something that puts me out of their reach. Which is also a bit risky in itself, but not hard. <laughs> Yeah, so we walk up on top of the back of the boat here, and you'll see that the Stafos won't be able to reach Danny B. And then, because they're a bit silly, they will hopefully walk right off the boat. There Bye. you go. Peace out. All right, good. <laughs> Every once in a while, they don't fall off, and if they're both there at the same time, they can actually push each other up the hill and hit me when I don't want them to. So, a little, little scary if that happens. Because if one of them does happen to slash me, uh, I, get, well, I will get damage recoiled off the back of the boat, which uh, is not good. And if they're both on the boat while the boat's there, it creates quite a bit of lag. So. So here there's a floor master we need to kill for a key. I could kill that in one shot, but I, sl I hit it twice just so that it pushes back to the back wall. And then when you kill when you uh, hit a floor master a couple times, it splits into three tiny ones. Um, and when it does that, they split in like a triangle from the central point. And with the wall right there, it actually makes the, the spread a little less. So I can hit them all with a quick spin. Because if you miss one and they start running away... And because they're uh, invisible, especially. And, yeah, and yeah. they're invisible, it can you know, waste tens of seconds or pretty quickly. And here he's going to move to the right slightly before casting Dinsfire to catch the redead. Otherwise he can scream and troll you a bit. So we're coming up on a small cutscene skip. Um, when I shoot down the statue, there's a cutscene of the statue falling over and creating a bridge. Um, but I'm just going to void out during that, that cutscene so I can skip it. So now the bridge is down. I didn't have to watch the cutscene. So the room before Bongo, there's a whole bunch of platforms, all of which are invisible, and you're supposed to have the lens of truth to see where you're going because there's holes and they don't line up properly and all that kind of stuff. But we know exactly where they are. Also, they're not lar or they're too far to jump, so double damage boost. I'm also going to cast Fairy's Wind here. This is not something I normally do at all. But in the event of something terrible happening and in fa in possibly dying to Bongo, um, traversing the Shadow Temple again is ridiculously slow. So I'm going to set that there just for a ton of safety. Nice. nice. Bongo Bongo time. Something very small here that some people don't know, uh, certainly casual players, um, is that if you hold down as the fight starts, Bongo won't spin around behind you. Fight. 
So Danny B had to stab there with relatively precise timing to keep Bongo stunned. Yeah, he hit his metronome again. So. Interestingly, that stab timing is exactly half the speed of uh, Owl Skips. It's uh, 150 beats per minute as opposed to 300. So I can just use the same metronome setting and stab every other beat. It's so close to him actually drumming that it's off very slightly. How's my health here? Do I need this? Yeah, I sort of do. So I usually always pick up that heart container because my health is usually really low after I beat Bongo, uh, just because Shadow Temple takes so much out of you. Um, in this case, I had a lot of health just because I was being really safe and getting extra hearts that I don't normally get. Um, but the other reason why I needed to pick up that heart container here, even though my health generally seemed okay, is that trials coming up, I have a fire trial, which again is one of those rooms with a heat timer like Fire Temple. Um, and so I need at least like, I guess, I don't know how much exactly you need, but four doesn't fill me with confidence. Yeah, I'm not sure how much you need. Either. So we've got some cutscenes here. Donations are cool. We have a $20.13 donation from Michelle154. Happy three years, Dan. I'm so oh. proud of you and so excited to watch you run. Thanks to all the staff, volunteers, attendees, and runners for such a wonderful event. Love you, Michelle. She's back there on the couch. She came with me, learned a lot about speed running this week. <laughs> Not this couch, the one behind that. None of these guys. <laughs> $50 donation from MS. I know this isn't very much, but this donation serves as a huge thank you to Danny, the couch, and the, those phenomenal Navi impressions that have made this OOT run so magical. Thank you all for taking me along with you on this nostalgic journey that has made such a mundane Friday night an amazing one. Cheers! A $50 donation from Rat Pack M. So happy to see a glitchless OOT run. None of that 15 minute any percent stuff. <laughs> Good old fashioned movement abuse. Good luck to all the remaining runners and thank you to everyone who makes GDQ happen. Speaking of any percent, Torsha is the current world record holder. <laughs> $25 donation from Miroriki. Was afraid I would miss the Ocarina of Time run, but managed to make it home in time for the hype. Here's to a great run. Hype. hype. <laughs> okay, there we go. $40 donation from Philold09. Ocarina of Time is a classic. It's amazing to be seen live. Good luck to the runner and kill those animals. $40 donation from Leah. Had to donate during one of my favorite games. Ocarina of Time is what first got me interested in speedrunning, and I'm never not amazed by the sheer number of tricks and optimizations that have been found in the game. Good luck on the run, and let's kill those animals. Chris, Chris Armstrong donated $50 and said simply, both this game and my childhood have been destroyed by this run. I approve. $300 anonymous donation. Love Zelda, but Diablo needs more moo. And that is actually a donation incentive that is, let me refresh. Not quite met yet. We're, I think, still just under half of that $25,000 goal. And the Pokemon Blue is also way, way away from that goal. We still need over 45, uh, sorry, $35,000 for that. So let's keep getting those donations in. A $50 donation from Micro Reality. Been looking forward to SGDQ ever since AGDQ. I've never played Ocarina, too busy playing StarCraft probably. So I'm very much enjoying watching the glitchless run. Good luck, Danny B. Runner's choice. All right, so I think we'll finally get to find out who this person is. <laughs> <laughs> the suspense. Link. <laughs> if you haven't played this game, look away now. <laughs> oh my god, it's Peach. It's Peach. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I guess I'll take a minute here to talk about myself, how I got into speedrunning. Um, I started watching speedruns of this game in 2013, and I tried a couple glitchless runs, and I think my time was like eight hours for the first one, six and a half hours for the second one. And they weren't so much speedruns as much as just me playing through the game from my childhood memory. Um, but I really liked it, and then when I finished school in 2014, I started to devote a lot of time to it. I started streaming in September of 2014. Um, and it's been a really cool year and a half, almost two years. And uh, I had the world record for this category for about three months uh, before Makai took it, and he's currently 11 seconds ahead of me with a 3.38.10. And most of my streams lately have been devoted to me shaving off 12 seconds or more, uh, hopefully getting at least 22 seconds or more for the 3.37. Um, but the grind for this category has been really cool, and I've learned a lot about the game since then. Uh, and then a few months ago, I started to branch out and learn other things because Glitchless, while it's really good and it teaches you basic skills and uh, movement mechanics and stuff like that, there's so much more to learn about this game, and some of that you'll see in a uh, little while with Pedicarus' Glitch Exhibition. Um, but I started to learn other categories, and I set a goal for myself. By the end of 2016, I wanted to be top 10 in every category in this game. Uh, and so between February and May, uh, I actually got top 10 in seven out of the 10 categories that I've been working on. Uh, currently working on any percent. I've got about 30 seconds left to shave off before top 10 there. And then the only two remaining categories are the two, facet, or the two categories which are fastest on Nintendo 64 instead of the Wii, which I'm used to. Uh, so I'm saving those for last, and that'll be Ganalus and 100% coming up hopefully by like the end of the summer or so. Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to reach that goal of getting top 10 and everything. Talking about the community and getting into running, and also sort of responding to a comment from earlier, somebody that said they were going to take out their Zelda cartridge and play and try some of these tricks. I wanted to say that like anybody who's considering doing that, you should totally go for it. Um, there are tons of tutorials out there on YouTube, um, all of our channels, there's a couple dozen OT runners back there. Come to our Twitch channel, <laughs> ask us questions, we'll totally help you. More OT runners, the better. Um, so if you're thinking about giving, a, giving it a go, definitely do so. Yeah, this, this game can be really daunting to learn just because of how much stuff there is to know. I mean, I'm still learning things every week. I'll find something that I've never seen before in my entire life, and then I'll ask people and someone will explain it to me. And, like, everyone as a collective knows <laughs> so many things, uh, and it really helps out to get better and learn about the game. Everyone's really helpful. All right, so coming up on the final section here, Ganon's Castle. The trials are really fun, they're unique. It's just a, a bunch of really small mini dungeons in a row. Um, and I guess something I want to talk about here is equips, because I'm going to be changing out my equips really frequently, almost every room, or every trial. And uh, memorizing your equips and memorizing how to move your cursor through the pause menu to best set those equips is actually really important, and it's something that a lot of people don't pay attention to. Um, you know, there's, I don't know how many equips there are on this run, there's got to be over 50. But, you know, if I lose a second or two per equip just because I'm not used to it and I don't have the muscle memory right down, that's already like a minute and a half of my run gone just because I lost a second per equip. So it's something that you really should pay attention to. It's one of those really minor things that ends up costing a lot over the course of the run. Rainbow Road's a lot smaller these days. <laughs> All right, so something I need to pay attention to is I only have three quarters magic because of that Ferris Wind I casted at the end of Shadow Temple that I don't usually cast. I'm usually at full magic here, so I'll have to make sure to pick up an extra magic pot. So this room without fire arrows. Not hard. <laughs> um, now, if I were to kill that Wolfos, I'd get a treasure chest spawning. Um, that treasure chest is not useful at all. Uh, nice equip. See? This is what I was talking about. <laughs> Get away from- Oh my! He just pushed me off the door! <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so we are doing this hover bootless, which is a little bit tricky. So that fan gave me a little boost there. Nice. Wow, 
Oh, the Beemos is strong right now. Yeah, bad manners from the Beemos. Alright, but that was fairly clean forest trial, except for that equip. I probably should have gotten the magic drop from here because I'm actually not 100% sure if the end of Water Trial has magic. So we'll see. I want to say it does. I think Shadow does. I know uh, Shadow, Shadow has a ton. Sure. Shadow's got two big big pots. Equips, please. <laughs> okay, good enough. See, the end of the run here is something that Obviously, I don't get to as often as everything else, so some of the equipped muscle memory can actually be uh, a little bit wonky. If one of these uh, freezers drops magic, I'm going to pick it up. See up there to avoid some of the lag of that ice melting. Doesn't seem like they dropped anything. Alright, so this block puzzle is pretty useless. Attacking through walls again. One of those things that looks a little weird, but it's totally cool. I feel like the right pot has magic. Yeah. Nice. Good call. All right, so something I'm about to do before Shadow Trial is I'm going to swing my hammer seemingly at nothing. And that's uh, because Power Crouch Stabs, uh, which is storing damage to your Crouch Stabs, uh, doesn't only store the damage value, but it also stores the damage type. Um, and so when I swing my hammer here, I'm going to store hammer type damage to my sword. And that'll be useful in a sec here. Uh, what else do I need? Light arrows. <laughs> <laughs> you cursed yourself by talking about equipment. Yeah, I did. Exactly. I'm like forgetting all of them. Now. So typically you would shoot a fire arrow at that torch. So I'm going to line up my aim here beforehand so that as soon as the Din's fire takes care of this torch, I can long shot this guy. Fill up on magic. And there's this invisible platform here. Alright. So, I still got hammer type t uh, damage stored to my sword because I haven't swung my sword. Uh, so that rusted switch over there is going to feel my wrath. Or not. <laughs> uh, that was supposed to be a side hop, not a jump slash, so I'm going to just reline up here. So because he jump slashed with the sword, it overwrote the storage of the hammer. Alright, so I'm going to do an equip early here, just to save one. So no, what was supposed to happen was I was supposed to just stab, uh, stab the switch with my sword, and it would have worked. Also, that torch is really weird. The top half of that torch like doesn't exist. That's rough. I'll need to pick up magic in uh, Light Trial now. So next is Fire Trial, which can be tricky. And the tough part about this run is that trials are pretty demanding as far as like remembering all of your equips, and it's really fast-paced. There's a lot of stuff going on. And at the end of a run like this, something so demanding is kind of draining. So, if you notice, you know, been a little bit messy. Not unheard of. And as Danny B mentioned earlier, like when you're grinding runs for a PB, most of them don't make it to the end. You end up resetting early, you're in the middle. Um, so just not as many runs get to trials, so you don't practice trials as often unless you 
specifically make time to practice it. I could jump slash to avoid grabbing that edge, but it's, it's scary. And I have to redo the whole room if I missed it. So you can see this timer is a little bit tight. Uh, that's why we're getting enough heart containers and making sure Danny B has enough health before we enter fire trial. Alright, so I know Light Trial has, uh, has a magic pot at the end. Light Trial is pretty weird. It's like, I mean, there's no light dungeon, so it doesn't really have anything to draw on. Uh, so it's just a bunch of invisible enemies, and then you play, uh, what's it called, Zelda's Lullaby on a Triforce symbol one time, <laughs> and then you just avoid some boulders. It's like, I don't know, they gave it to the intern. It's really <laughs> boring. <laughs> But we get to see this cool throwing animation. That's again. true. <laughs> so there's all these chests, and you're like, okay, maybe one of them has a key, but they're all traps or rupees. You need to kill all the invisible enemies. All in hearts. I wonder what to do here. <laughs> Alright, so the next room, uh, there actually is something kind of interesting about the next room. Uh, and that's that if you're fast, you can make a boulder cycle that is kind of tough to make, so I'm going to try to stay ahead of these boulders. That one in particular, and also every time I enter one of these alcoves, the camera changes in a really, oh, okay, a really crappy way, so learning to uh, expect what the camera's going to do is kind of integral to doing that room quickly. All right, so I don't have enough magic to shoot a light arrow, so I have to do a couple extra rolls here to take that. And that chest that spawned after he uh, played Zelda's Lullaby, if you stand under it while it's falling, you can void. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we have one more trial. Only spirit is left. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> For a second there, I was like, or maybe I'm terribly wrong. I miscounted. I mean, climbing the tower is no easy feat either. So there's more silver rupees to collect. It's kind of a theme. As soon as I roll right through that guy by using invincibility frames during the roll. It's actually nice if that last spiky thing hits him and bounces him back towards the door. Also, fun fact, this is the only place in the entire game where you're required to have bomb chews to go through that little hole in the top of the wall. I'm going to fill up a magic here just to be safe. So, this without fire arrows is also not that hard, but it's a little outside the box. You can barely make that shot. Nice. All right, and the final equip of the game is hammer, light arrows, and a bottle. That bottle equip is optional, but it'll be useful later. Hammer and light arrows are actually the only two items I need. Alright, so now the barrier goes up and we have a bunch of enemies to fight before we get to Ganondorf. Hey. 
I'm really happy that in this first room you don't need to worry about all these keys, because if I actually had to kill all these keys, that'd be really boring. Uh, so these first two enemies are pretty trolly. Um, they're very agile. Uh, so the best thing to do is to charge up a great spin, and you can get both of them twice. Nice quick spins. <laughs> nice, okay. If you notice, I quick spin a couple times there, and he actually jumped away fast enough to avoid the damage. And that happens quite a lot. And then more stealthers. Because what would it run? Don't go in the fire. Okay. Okay. So shoutouts to DF here. <laughs> who taught me a lot about the game, but uh, when I had the world record for this category, it was a 339.4. I really wanted the 338. Um, and after the run, DF told me that opening or rolling around that treasure chest instead of backflipping over it saves a half a second. So, would have been 338. So if things go well, we can kill both of these knuckles simultaneously. Have to be a little bit brave and know that their armor is going to come off and get stunned. Ooh. Okay. I don't know how they got these things. Yeah, so sometimes it doesn't look like they move away from one another, but your sword hitbox just doesn't connect and something like that happens. Yeah. Not really too much you can do about that sometimes. They just desync for no reason that you can really pay attention to. Thankfully, this is glitchless and we have a lot of health. Yeah. Uh, In many runs, you have less than four hearts here, or four, and you die from one hit. All right, so all we have left is Ganondorf. <laughs> Danny B is going to try to one-cycle this fight. Um, it's pretty challenging. Uh, he needs to stab with quite good timing to keep Ganondorf stunned. But if anybody can do it, it's Danny B. So you gotta hit him 10 times, he's got 40 health, each, each crouch stab does 4 damage from jump slashes. Um, and each time I stab him, after the third stab, he's gonna try to get up. Uh, but I think I have 2 or 3 frames, I'm not sure exactly how many. Um, but uh, if I crouch stab within that small window, he will stay down. So if I can hit that 2 or 3 frame window 7 times in a row, after the first 3, which are free, uh, I will be able to one cycle him, otherwise I gotta play tennis twice. Or more times, depending on how many times I fail. <laughs> it's also a good time to mention that uh, in Glitchless, a lot of boss fights are actually a bit more difficult than in, uh, in glitch categories because ISG, which is the infinite sword glitch, which is the glitch that does damage on every frame automatically, sort of does that timing work for you. And so the moment that he can be hit, he will be hit if you have ISG. So I have to actually deal with timing, whereas ISG sort of takes care of it. But interestingly enough, despite the fact that ISG is easier, it's actually slightly slower because it takes time to get ISG. There's that bottle. Yeah, the reason for the bottle is if you use your sword, there's less frames. The bottle takes forever to swing, and it just happens to reflect. Okay. Nice. So two cycles there not the wor is not the worst thing, um, especially because you don't actually have to play tennis. If you jump to the center platform, he gets hit pretty much every time on one volley. Uh, so it doesn't lose too much time. On rare occasions, though, the lightning ball will sort of go behind Ganondorf and then magically slingshot back towards you. Um, so you have to be ready. Many runs have died to lightning balls to the face. 
With the bottle, it's actually never happened to me. Um, really? Some people, instead of using the bottle, what they do is they jump to the center platform and quick spin, and for the entire time that you have the blue uh, light around you from the spin attack, you can reflect the ball. Uh, I don't do that just because I'm terrible at quick spins. So. Uh, but in, in when people do that, I've actually found it more likely for him to return one volley, and then you have to be ready for a second quick spin. Uh, so the tower collapse, I will not be hessing to impress. <laughs> Which means, of course, that I have to fight Stalfos again. There's a lot of lag here. If you notice, I'm moving pretty slowly. Um, we're pretty sure that's from Ganondorf's body lying up there. In particular, maybe his cape. Because if you void out, like if you jump into the void and reload, his body's gone and you don't have any lag there. Um, and that's actually pretty important to any percent runs who do have to Hess here. Uh, because it's really laggy and you have to learn it with, or you have to learn the Hess with the lag. And if you happen to void out, then you don't have lag and it's very different. Uh, so if you notice on some of these bars, see this purple light that she puts up when she gets rid of the gate for me? If I shoot a light arrow at the gate, the yellow halo that shows up from my arrow overrides her purple one. Also, I can't get by her right now. Um, and I'm not really sure how important it is on VC, but I've been told on N64 the purple lags more than the yellow. Uh, and so it's a small lag reduction strat to shoot a light arrow. Here, I'll show it here even though I don't need to. See, there's no purple that time. I've never really found it to make a difference on Virtual Console, though. Alright, here's the Stealthos. This is the most snowing Stealthos fight, typically, because they like to hide behind the fire rock and in the fire. No. Also Zelda. Stop dancing. Please. Oh my goodness. Please. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes if they just keep dancing and they don't do anything, it can be really slow. I'm ex exiting this room at 158. My fastest is 212, so I just lost like 14 seconds to an optimal Stalfos fight. Um, some strats you can do to mitigate that. If you target the Stealthos, I think he's more likely to become aggressive. Um, but I, I personally just don't like that strat, so I avoid it. On this staircase, it's important to not run too fast. In particular, don't roll, um, because if you get ahead of Zelda, she will stop because she thinks you're too far behind when you're actually too far ahead, and then you have to backtrack to catch up with her. Similarly, if you run into the rocks, Zelda gasps, and that can cause her to pause and waste some time. That redead is useless. He doesn't know what he's doing, really. During this tower collapse cutscene coming up, if you listen really closely, <laughs> it saves two frames. Okay. <laughs> so that was the kiss. Yeah. If you get in a very particular position, uh, Zelda pushes into you and pushes you into the load. Uh, Danny be cheated and used the setup though. It's okay. <laughs> if you listen closely during this cutscene, because we're on VC. They actually delayed the audio for N64, but VC doesn't lag as much, so it gets desynced. It's kind of funny. And this cutscene actually uh, lags depending on how much debris there is flying around, which is random. Um, and so it can lag more or less and affect your best split on Ganon. Something that was known to people who tasked this game, uh, but not really to the general community until uh, Torch's Fast Wii was discovered recently. <laughs> <laughs> Had to do it. <laughs> it's 
final fight. So that uh, power crouch stab with the hammer, or, or, or with the sword that I was supposed to store hammer damage in Shadow Trial, I'm going to be doing that again here, because the way Ganon works is everything does one damage to Ganon, except for the Master Sword and Deka Sticks, as far as any percent goes, but I can't use Deka Sticks here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to store a Master Sword Jump Slash before the fight, and then when the fight starts, I won't have my Master Sword, of course, because Ganon knocks it away. Um, but if I stab with my hammer, uh, I'll be able to do Master Sword type damage with the hammer uh, and do four damage on each of three stabs and finish the first phase where he has 10 health, uh, where otherwise it would take 10 hits. Fun fact, if you super slide into this cutscene uh, and hold your shield up the whole time, you can keep your sword here which is a good strat people use in several glitched runs, who, especially when they don't have the hammer to help out. I've always kind of wished that this fight was a bit more epic to end the game, <laughs> but we just roll under his legs and stab him in the tail. All right, so time's coming up in about 45 seconds. Clean, that was good. All right, so that's Glitchless. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, so I guess coming up next is Pedicarus's Glitch Exhibition, and that's going to be really exciting. I know you guys are all sleepy because it's late, but you should definitely stay up and watch it because he worked hard on making it really cool. Uh, and just as a little introduction to show you what glitches are all about and to prove that I can actually do them. <laughs> Time. Time right there. <laughs> 343.55, okay. 343 is not so bad. Um, I guess my estimate was 345, so I came in under even with all the safety strats, so I'm pretty happy with that. So thanks so much for having me, guys. I uh, really had a lot of fun, and I guess Pitt's coming up next with the Glitch Exhibition, so stick around. It's an absolutely amazing show of endurance there. I don't know how many people who could sit and continuously perform for three hours and 43 minutes. So thank you very much. One more time. Next, as Danny B said, we have the Glitch Exhibition. Um, but while we're setting up for that, let me remind you, for all you tuning in or who tuned in during that run, we are Summer Games Done Quick 2016. We are raising money for Doctors Without Borders. We passed the $750,000 mark during that run, which makes us three quarters of the way to a million dollars donated. We still have, oh...